com backslash wake up call DT. I hope you're having yourselves a great and fantastic morning. I hope you're making the most of the life that you have out there right now and truly appreciating those that you have in your life, the opportunities that you have and everything that's come forward. Because listen, life is precious and you never know what today's going to bring and what tomorrow is going to bring. So it's important to appreciate and respect the time that we have. So I hope you're doing well and I hope you're having a great day and I hope you started this week off on the right foot. And no matter what has happened up to this point, I hope it only gets better from here. So if it's good, I hope it gets better. And if it's been trying, I hope it gets better, clearer, and that things work out. So my best to each and every single one of you this week. For those of you in the snow tundra, like we are here in central and upstate New York, uh, please, uh, I mean, everybody everywhere, be safe when you're going out doing your thing and, and whatnot, as well as uh, when you're staying back at home. But definitely, uh, for those of us dealing with this weather, please be safe, please be smart, and take your time. Give yourself some extra time. You know, I'm, I'm a culprit of not doing this, so make sure that you do that. Give yourself extra time when you're traveling so that you can make sure that you get there in one piece and just be safe going out there doing your thing because, you know, this is... This weather gets crazy, and you know when this weather gets crazy, sometimes it uh, causes a lot of issues it doesn't need to cause because we tend to drive, you know, at the same pace that we would drive if there's no snow or whatever's going on. So just be smart about how you go about your day today, and be uh, be courteous and be kind on the road because this, you know, could be a very a dicey day. There's a lot of ice outside to go with the snow, so just give yourself some extra time when you're traveling and just be smart about it. And if you don't have to go anywhere, then, you know, maybe just hang back at home, you know, and enjoy that time at home. So uh, just be careful being out there and do the best you can, you know. I don't mean to sound like a parent this morning, but I know that uh, I know that we don't always tend to drive the safest and when we're trying to get somewhere too. So just be smart about what you're doing and uh, be good out there. To each and every one of you, I send you my best. So with that being said, here on Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora, plenty of show coming up for you today. Very excited about the opportunities that we have inside of the Cafe Kubal Studios. You are listening on mixlr.com backslash wakeupcalldt. As well as on wakeupcalldt.com's homepage, you are watching on Facebook Live on facebook.com backslash live now DT and on youtube.com backslash wakeupcalldt. So, however, you're connecting with the show, thank you so much for being a part of it and for hanging out with us here where sports meets life. Inside of on popcorn.com's What's Poppin'? We'll be bringing today to you. Two awesome guests and, of course, our ingredients to success to always wrap up every single uh, Tuesday broadcast. We'll start off the show with Wolfgang Schaefer joining us. Uh, you know that uh, this week we started off the broadcast with a bunch of people that were hired by Scott Schaefer to be a part of the Syracuse football staff just a few years back. And his son, Wolf, was here in Syracuse, obviously going to school and doing his thing. He eventually went off to Ithaca College and not only was a student, but was an athlete as well and played on the team. And then he went from there to Middle Tennessee State and worked there with his father and has now accepted a job at Marietta College, NCAA Division III football, to be the defensive backs coach. So we'll be catching up with Wolf. I haven't talked to Wolf really, I mean, outside of a message here or there. Haven't spoken to him. Uh, he went to Maryland and Elsa and Missy. Uh, his daughter and wife, respectively, they stayed here as Elsa finished up school, and Wolf was out in Ithaca, and so it's been a bit since I've gotten the opportunity to speak with Wolf, and I'm excited that we get to do that in just about 10 minutes here, where sports meets life on Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora at 9.15 a.m. Eastern Time, and then at 10.15 a.m. Eastern Time, I'll have the pleasure of having my friend back here on the broadcast who I'm very excited to have as always Mr. Roosevelt Bowie Jr. We'll be catching up with Rosie about how fishing is going. You know he's talked to me before about fishing and Jim Bayheim and the connection to fishing and whatnot so we'll talk with Rosie about how life is going through sports and coronavirus, what he's seen from it, the advice he has to adversity as well as uh, his take on the Syracuse basketball team this season, if he feels like there should have been a season, and so much more. So Rosie and I will definitely uh, be catching up on a lot of different topics, and it's been a minute since he's been on the show as well. So we'll have some fun with Roosevelt 
Bowie Jr. in just a little bit. And then we'll get into the ingredients to success proudly presented by Avicoli's on the corner of Route 57 and Wetzel Road in Liverpool, New York, where we will be this week with the Liverpool Warriors girls basketball team. We'll be on site on location at Avicoli's to do our broadcast, and I'm very excited about the opportunity to do that. So you'll hear the ingredients to success today at 10.50 a.m. Eastern Time, and from there, uh, we'll get you set and ready to see us in just a little bit on site, on location at Avicoli's this Wednesday, February 17th, which is Ash Wednesday. Uh, we'll be down, we'll be there at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. And for those of you that are out of town and can't make it, We'll be live right here on Facebook.com backslash live now DT. And for those of you that can come over for a slice and have some fun with us, we will be on location at the corner of Route 57 and Wetzel Road in Liverpool, New York. So a lot of great stuff coming up, a lot of awesome things. We're going to be on site, on location for a few different things this week, which I'm very, very excited about and honored to do. And so with that being stated, I thank you all for being here, and I'm happy, as always, to bring you this broadcast and to uh, be able to do what I love. So thank you for that, and uh, thank you for all the positivity that you bring to my life and all the good that you send my way. I'm sending it right back to you, and I really, really hope that the things that you're praying for and hoping on work out for the best, and you get that clarity, and you get whatever you need in order to move forward today. I really do pray and hope the best for everybody out there. No matter what it is and no matter what's going on, you got my... Uh, you got my best sending to you today. So please uh, please know that. With, with that being stated, like I said, plenty of show coming up. I do want to let everybody know we are in the process right now of doing something really, really cool. And I'm very, very much excited about this. And that is the fact that we will have the opportunity to start selling our apparel from Mark Products, and uh, we're going to be setting this up and doing some really cool things. So once they are available, we'll be able to put these up, and you'll be able to get them on my website on wakeupcalldt.com. That's wakeupcalldt.com. We're going to start uh, putting things out there for sale, and I'll let you know as soon as we do that. I want to give a shout out to Mark Products. They are in the process of doing a lot of cool stuff for us. We already have a lot of the wake up call gear out, and we have a lot of the uh, Dance Torah broadcast media gear out as well. So once that stuff starts to go on sale, we will definitely uh, send you the links, give you the information, and give you an opportunity to go out and get it. And for those of you that have called Mark Products, gotten in touch with them, reached out to them regarding this, thank you so much. I cannot tell you how much that means to me. It means the world to me. So thank you for putting yourself out there and, uh, and, and making that phone call and asking about the products because that really, uh, to me, goes a, a super long way, means the world to me. And, uh, you know, <laughs> it's just one of those things where it very much humbles me that's, that somebody would want to buy the gear and, you know, to connect with the show in that respect. That really goes a very, very, very long way with me, and, and I don't know how to thank you enough for that. So I appreciate you, and once those are ready, we will definitely uh, let you know, and you can be sure on that. There's a couple things that happened here while well, we got a few minutes before Wolf comes on to kind of take care of some different things going on in the world of sports to talk about these. I do want to, can't even believe this, uh, and I can't even believe how young he is. I, I'm 35 and some change. And uh, this man, Vincent Jackson, yeah, 38 years old, was found having deceased in Florida. Uh, former wide receiver for the NFL, Vincent Jackson, was found dead on Monday in a Florida hotel room. And he was uh, found at approximately 11.30 a.m. Eastern Time at the Homewood Suites in Brandon, Florida. There was no apparent sign of trauma, they said, and, and it's open and investigate the uh, Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office open an investigation. According to the hotel staff, Jackson, who's a South Tampa resident, checked into the hotel on January 11th and had been staying in a room since January 11th to yesterday. And so obviously, for those of you playing the home game, that's over a month that he was at the hotel. It's uh, Jackson's family reporting him missing on Wednesday and a formal report was filed Thursday but police located Jackson at the Homewood Suites on Friday. The missing person's case was canceled after Jackson's well-being was confirmed. Now, this is uh, Sheriff Chad 
Chronister said, uh, quote, My heart aches for the many loved ones Vincent Jackson leaves behind, from his wife and children to the Buccaneers nation that adored him. Mr. Jackson was a devoted man who put his family and community above everything else. He will be sorely missed by not only football fans across the country, but also the people in Hillsborough County who reap the benefits of his generous contributions. End quote. And you know, we got a message here from the Tampa Bay Buccaneers who just are coming off of winning the NFL championship game. The Buccaneers released a statement, and this is what it says. And, uh, Brian Glazer, the Buccaneers owner and co-chairman, said, quote, We are shocked and saddened to hear the terrible news regarding the loss of Vincent Jackson. During his five seasons with our franchise, Vincent was a consummate professional who took a great deal of pride in his performance on and off the football field. Vincent was a dedicated father, husband, businessman, and philanthropist who made a deep impact on our community through his unyielding advocacy for military families, supported by the Jackson in Action 83 Foundation. He was a three-time Pro Bowl selection for his accomplishments on the field, but his greatest achievements as a Buccaneer were the four consecutive nominations he earned as our Walter Payton Man of the Year. Our deepest condolences go out to his wife, Lindsay, and the entire Jackson family. End quote. So, that is from the, the, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Uh, played in the NFL. The last time he played was in 2016 with Tampa. And he spent five years of his career there. He is ranked fourth in franchise history with 4,326 receiving yards and 10th in Tampa Bay Buccaneers history with 268 receptions. He was a son of military parents, and he found, founded that Jackson and Action 83 Foundation in support of military families. And the foundation tweeted that Jackson's, quote, wife and family asked that everyone respect their privacy at this time, end quote. So... He also played with the Chargers. I'm getting kind of worked up about this because I told you that the night of Valentine's Day, I saw a car off the road and what I believe to be somebody still in it. Um, the Chargers, who also had Vincent Jackson for some time, said, quote, We are shocked and deeply saddened by news of Vincent Jackson's sudden passing. Vincent was, a fa Vincent was a fan favorite not only for his Pro Bowl play on the field, but for the impact he made on the community off of it. The work he has done on behalf of military families through his foundation in the years since his retirement has been an inspiration to all of us. We simply cannot believe he's gone, and our hearts go out to his wife Lindsay, their children, his parents, former teammates, and everyone whose lives were touched by having known Vincent. So, folks, you know, again... Not to sound like a broken record. Life is absolutely positively precious. And you cannot afford to waste a second. Nor should you waste a second. And I really, really, really hope that uh, you take calculated risks. You go after what you want. And you don't waste a moment. If there's something good in your life, you hold on to it. And Vincent... I can't, I mean, he's 38 years old, for God, I mean, it's not okay. It's not okay. So, you know, I don't really have words other than the fact that, Vincent, I hope that you're up in heaven. I hope you're safe and happy and healthy. I hope you're well, and I hope whatever was going on here is not hurting you there. So God bless you, and God bless to your family and your loved ones overall, and to everybody whose life you touched, and I hope the foundation continues to roll and do great things for the community. So thank you for helping military families, and I appreciate that because a lot of my family was in the military, in the Army, in the Navy, in the Air Force, so on behalf of them, thank you, and thank you to your family for their service. We'll take a step aside for a fast break. When we come back, Wolfgang Schaefer will be joining us here where sports meets life inside of the Cafe Kubal Studios on Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora.
Carvel DeWitt, it's what happy tastes like. Do you know why? Because we make ice cream. Creamy, rich, flavorful ice cream. Not yogurt or iced milk like some of our competitors. Ice cream. Fresh, by hand, daily. For the calorie conscious, we have something new for you. Our new Carvelite. Same great flavor, creaminess, and texture of our regular ice cream with only 35 calories an ounce. So whether you want an ice cream cake, flying saucer, dasher, Carvelanche, hard or soft ice cream, we will satisfy your craving with our fresh, handmade, regular, or new Carvelite ice cream. Carvel DeWitt. It's what happy tastes like. Cafe Cabal offers same-day local delivery of our products, offering no delivery charge for Onondaga County. Shop CafeCabal.com for fresh roasted coffee beans, cold brew, travel mugs, and all your essential Cafe Cabal needs. Cafe Cabal, coffee for the soul. The Wildcat Sports Pub in Camillus, New York, is located on 3680 Milton Avenue in the Home Depot Plaza. It is your family-friendly sports bar and restaurant. Folks, some sports bars aren't family-friendly. Some family-friendly restaurants are not sports bars. The Wildcat Sports Pub in Camillus, New York, is proud to be both. It is that marriage that you've been looking for for years. The Wildcat Sports Pub is your home base for your sports bar and restaurant needs, games for the kids, indoor and outdoor activities, and enough things on the menu to come back every single week and get to try something new. They're open Sundays from noon to 8 p.m., Monday through Wednesday, 11 a.m. to 11 p.m., and Thursday through Saturday from 11 a.m. to midnight. For reservations and party information, call 315 315- 487-2222 for the Wildcat family-friendly sports pub and restaurant. Welcome back here to Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora on WakeUpCallDT.com, your one-stop sports shop, and on MixLR.com backslash WakeUpCallDT. I hope you're having yourselves a tremendous morning and making the most of your day and uh, truly, you know, out there doing good things, being safe, staying safe, and uh, you being good to, uh, to everybody that you come into contact with. You know, as we've said on the show before, you never know how someone's day is going, so you know, you might be the only interaction that they have that day. So how you treat them goes a long way. So make sure you're out there putting good into this world. And back here on Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora, where sports meets life, on mixlr.com backslash wakeupcalldt, as well as wakeupcalldt.com. You're also watching on youtube.com backslash wakeupcalldt and on facebook.com backslash live now dt. So however you're connecting with the show, thank you so much for being here and at this point in the show, I have the pleasure to welcome, for the first time in a long time, uh, Mr. Wolfgang Schaefer to it. Uh, him and I have traded some text messages here and there over these last few years, but it's been a long time since we've been in the same place. I respect him, Missy, Elsa, and of course, Scott, and the Schaefer family will always have a very, very uh, special place in my heart. So it is more than a pleasure to welcome Wolf to the show. Let's bring him in. Wolf, how are we doing today? Hey, what's going on, Dan? It's, it's good to be back with you, man. Like you said, it's been a uh, it's been a long time, but it, it's good to get back with you. You know, and, and Wolf, and I appreciate you being here. I mean, when you were in Syracuse, I mean, you're a kid. And so let, let's go all the way back to Scott gets, you know, I mean, I, obviously the family, he was a defensive coordinator and got elevated to the head coach. So bring me into when Scott initially comes here under Doug Marone and, you know, your family tries to, you know, build a life in central New York. Let's go back to those days. Yeah, it's funny thinking back on it. Uh, we were, he had just gotten fired from, from Michigan and we, we took a vacation down in South Florida 
and I remember uh, Doug Marone came down, interviewed him down there while we were on vacation, which was a pretty unique deal. Um, ended up taking the job, you know, obviously uh, bouncing around as a kid. Um, I was in eighth grade at the time, and we had just come off a spurt where we, I think it was like four moves in four years. I mean, it was it was quite a bit there. Um, and, you know, next move – going from Ann Arbor out to Syracuse and, and it was uh it, it was exciting didn't you know hadn't been to New York before and um you know getting ready to get into high school it was kind of one of those deals where we had talked about I'll uh, get through get through the high school years in one place um obviously not knowing you know the necessary security age job in, in the coaching profession um but we got lucky to, to get through high school there. And then obviously I stayed in central New York for, for undergrad. Um, and it was a really good experience. Absolutely loved uh, getting to grow up in, in, in the Fayetteville Manlius community right there outside of Syracuse. And, um, you know, I know my sister feels the same way. And, you know, we were, we were very, very lucky to get through uh, those formative years through high school uh, where we did. And, and, you know, it's been, it's, shoot, it's been a while since I've been back. You know, I've, I'm, I'm getting married in July. I met my fiance at Ithaca College. She's from just south of Buffalo, New York, and I still haven't gotten a chance to take her up to Syracuse and, and see see the old stomping ground. So, so talking to you and thinking back on these things, it's uh, bringing back some good memories. Yeah, you know, and here with Wolfgang Schaefer inside of the Cafe Kubal Studios here on Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora. You know, I want I want to go to that you because uh, we we I mean I was gonna get into Ithaca College, but you uh, you met your mate at Ithaca. Tell me about that story. Yeah, um, you know, so I, playing on the football team, those were kind of the guys that I, I became tight with early on, and um, you know, we met some we met some girls like two weeks in um, to college, and uh, so her name's Leah, her friend group, and then my friend group. We started kind of running around together about two or three weeks into school, freshman year, um, and and we were friends all the way through. We didn't we didn't start dating until end of senior year, um, and which ended up being a cool friend first, and, you know that blossomed into what it is now, obviously. And uh, so it, it's funny looking back at it now, just where we were at as freshmen running around to. You know, end of senior year, where, where that we're in that honeymoon phase and really started falling for each other, and then uh, you know, moving down, moving down to Tennessee, she ended up, she ended up finding a job in Nashville, so we got to be in the same place there and um, continuing our relationship, and, and then you know, jumping to Texas, and, and now out back out east in Ohio and southeast Ohio. It's uh, looking back, it's funny to see how that all that all you know played out. Through, through the college years into now. So it was a really cool deal for us. You know, and for, for you to go out to Ithaca, I know that it was uh, really important for for your dad and former Syracuse head coach, uh, Scott Schaefer, to, you know, be able to see you play and see you do your thing. Bring me into uh, choosing to go to Ithaca College and then, you know, just the, the opportunity that you had to, you know, have your family that could come out and see you, have your dad that – you know, could get out there at times and support. I know when I spoke with him, it meant a lot to him. So bring me into your playing days at Ithaca. Yeah, um, it, it's funny. I, I was recruited by a number of those Division three schools in, in New York, and um, and it's kind of up being a, an easy choice, really, talking about the football program first uh, and foremost. You know, Mike Welch, the head coach at the time, who retired after my senior year, um, you know, there were a number of guys on that staff there that I, I developed relationships with, and they were my kind of people growing up around around football, specifically college football, um, all those years. Um, you know, I, I did get a chance to be around a lot of really good human beings that also coached football, and I got that same feel from, from the Ithaca College staff um, and, and fell in love with what they were doing, the way that program was run, the tradition of, of what Ithaca College football was. And it was really easy for me, um, you know, to, to be able to make that decision. Um, also, just, just the college itself, uh, you know, set there in, in central New York there. Um, just an absolutely beautiful campus, uh, beautiful surrounding area. Um, you know, so it, it ended up being an easy choice for me. Um, 
and, and I look back and that, those were the best four years of my life for a number of reasons. But, you know, get, getting to play there um, w- was great. And, you know, we, we joke a little bit, um, you know, when my dad got fired from Syracuse, obviously that was tough um, for all the obvious reasons. But um, it was a, also a blessing in disguise a little bit because he was able to take that that year off and it ended up being my senior year playing at Ithaca and he, he ended up being um, able to come to every one of my games which you know there's sacrifices in the coaching world um, and, and for him I, I never felt as a kid that he wasn't around enough never once felt that way he always made it a priority to, for, to be around you know the family um, but obviously uh, you know those first three years at Ithaca, he really wasn't able to make a lot of a lot of the my games because obviously they were playing on those Saturdays as well. So that senior season for me, where he took the year off and was able to make all of all of my games, was a really special year f- for me. And I know he'll say the same thing. Um, and and I don't think I really knew how special it was until after the fact, looking back on it. Um, and and it, it was a bl- it was a blessing in disguise. Yeah, you know, and, and and when you go back to that, I know your dad, uh, after getting fired at Syracuse, had originally accepted a job at Maryland, and then, you know, ended up ended up, uh, you know, just kind of saying, you know what, I'm not going to do that. Was from the outside looking in, knowing and being around your dad, and and really uh, personally getting to know him uh, more than professionally, and and spend some good quality time with him, and somebody that that will always matter to me was from my from my viewpoint it was like he took the job at Maryland and then it was like you know what I'm not going to get to see this like I want to see my kid play I want to have this I know I know Missy and Elsa were still here in the community because Elsa was finishing up school so uh, from what I saw and I mean obviously you could tell us what it was but did your dad take that time off because it was just like he was going to be in Maryland by himself all you all of you were in upstate New York I mean was it more of like hey you know what if I go here now, I get to sleep in my bed, I get to be around my family, and I get to see my son play. Was that a, a big part of it? Yeah, I think it was. And the way I look at it, and I think you're spot on, Dan, but he, he always preached as a coach, as a, as a father, as a husband, um, you know, family first and keeping things in perspective and your priorities in place. And, you know, taking that Maryland job, we were really excited. Um, and he was excited, and I think when he got there, um, you know, I think after investing his heart and soul into this, the Syracuse program and the community, um, you know, I think people can relate, but but it's hard to really know, like, him coming home after after work and talking about his, his vision for what, not hit just his version, his vision, but him and, and the staff and the players, everybody involved in the program, the vision for what Syracuse University football could be. You know, those three years as the head coach and the four years prior as the defensive coordinator, like there was a lot of time, energy, and, and thought that went into what he and the staff wanted to build. And when that kind of is just taken away and, um, you know, maybe a little bit earlier than expected. That a lot of that. I mean, that's that's exhausting. Um, and so for him to jump right into something after that, um, for as exciting as it was, I think it's kind of like, well, you got to you got to press pause and step back and look at where you're at in life. And he always talked to us about, like I said, priorities, family first. And I think for him, a couple things is he needed to. He needed to look. He looked at himself in the mirror and said, "Well, I need to need to practice what I'm preaching." And uh, he was in a unique place in life where he was able to step away and, um, you know, come and spend more time with my mom, and you know, obviously get to see me play my senior year and be around my sister because that was her senior year of high school. She was going into, um, you know, so I think all of that, everything that you said, spot on. He, uh, you know, he wanted to. He wanted to spend that time because life is way too short, and he had a unique opportunity to be able to do that. Uh, I know all three of us in the family are thankful that that he did, and aren't surprised that he made the decision that he did because it was hard on him. You know, like it was really hard, uh, hard to see him take a step back um, 
and because you know somebody who loves football and loves the coaching profession as much as he does you know that was a sacrifice it and it was the right sacrifice obviously but um you know it, it was a it ended up being a really good deal for all of us and all of us are very happy that he did it and you know he'll be the first to tell you it was it was the best best year best year of his life i think so um yeah, no, very, 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 very happy looking back, thinking, of, thinking of back on those conversations and you know what what came about to to make that decision. So, speaking here with Wolfgang Schaefer this morning on Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora inside of the Cafe Kubal Studios, uh, Wolf, for you know to to take a look at all of that, uh, knowing that your dad has been a coach for such a long time. To look out in the stands and be a quarterback for Ithaca College for the Bombers, and like you said, your your dad was at every game. To see him there, knowing that you know he, he had just just uh, come off of being a D one college football head coach. You you know you see you know all of the all the work that he's done and, and how it's taken him around the country to different places. You were in such a unique place. You were in, in Elsa that your father was there. And could I, and I know you said that you never felt like he wasn't, but to look in the stands at Ithaca and see Scott sitting there, I mean, what will that mean to you for the rest of your life? Because a lot of coaches, you know, always tell me about, listen, I, you know, I love my kids, I, I love my family, and you know, my my wife is is a trooper, and without her, you know, I wouldn't be able to do it. They talk about you know wives being single parents sometimes because they're going all over the place. To have your dad in the stands. When you looked off at, at that right before you hiked the ball, what did that mean to you? Because it's it, it, to me, it's such a rarity in the world of sports. Yeah, um, you know, meant meant everything. Anybody, you know, anybody thinking about what that would be like, it, it, it's it's you know, it's it's special. Um, it's special, and the thing about it that was really cool um, is, you know, after games win loss whether I played well or not it was always I'd go up to him and he'd look at me and he'd say all right do you want you want the dad talk or you want coach talk and I always used to get both and it was always you know depending on the outcome and the way I played it was that always determined whether or not I wanted the coach first or the dad first so um you know it was awesome because in in Elsa that your father you know depending on if I wanted the way I played I wanted the coach that always determined you know he was able to do that because obviously you know he was sitting up in the stands and watching and and critiquing but then uh, he would always give me the dad aspect to the support uh, the unwavering support and the love, the unconditional love, um, you know, and, and we're very similar people. So I think that that played into it, too, to where he, he pretty much already knew, you know, whether I wanted dad or coach first. He, he pretty much already knew as he was walking down uh, towards the field after the game. Um, but that was just special because I know how he knows how much I loved playing the game, but also playing for Ithaca College. Um so I think for him to see the pride that I took in that, I think that that was really special for him, and it was special, special for me, especially him being a Division three guy himself. You know, he played at Baldwin Wallace um, back back in the uh, you know late eighties, and you know, to, for him kind of come full circle and come back and watch watch me play the same position at a, at a similar Division three program in Ithaca, um, you know, the whole experience itself was really special for for both of us. And it was uh, looking back on that year, really, really cool, a really cool deal. You know, playing uh, at any division, D one, D two, D three, JUCO, and whatnot. Just, just to speak to that, the fact that you were on the field, that you got to have that experience, you got to establish a leadership role and play quarterback. Just what that'll always mean to you that at any level of collegiate play that you had the opportunity to go out there. Because I mean, I come from a D three school. I was recruited D three for basketball and. You know, I, I respect the life of D3, and I don't think it gets enough credit or anywhere near the credit that it deserves. And people also don't know that, you know, when you play D1, D2, you get scholarships. When you play D3, it's kind of like you're going to do the same work as everybody else, but you're not going to get the money for it. So uh, just speak on that the D3 world and, and how you really, really genuinely have to be committed to the love of the game because you don't have the perks that you have at D1 and D2. Yeah, you're exactly right, and um, you know you hear about 
you hear about compensation for playing and, and player image likeness and, and all that, and, and there's arguments on both sides. But I think the thing that's beautiful about Division three ball is, is it's so unique because, like you said, you know, you're not getting an athletic scholarship. Um, you know, you really got to love the game. It, it's so much pure – so much more pure i think at this level not necessarily always but if you're in the right program and around the right people the division three level is such a pure um you know experience for for the kid and you gotta have guys who love the game um and you know the thing the big difference is we're doing the same things that people you know at all the other levels are doing whether you're talking as a coaching staff or you're talking about the players you know it's it's just you don't have the resources that a lot of the the other you know bigger programs do so again you know you gotta you're not you don't have the training tables where after practice you shower and you walk out the door and 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 somebody's got a you know a steak mashed potatoes and and green beans waiting on you ready to go that you don't have to pay for um you know division three you're you're finishing up practice and you're walking all the way across campus and you have to swipe your card for the uh, uh, the meal plan that you're pay you're paying for your parents your family are paying for um you know and to you know to get that that pizza that slice of pizza or cheeseburger you know so it's it's all relative we're all doing the same thing it just looks it just looks a little bit different because of the resources and the money involved um but i i, I that's why i'm in love with the, the division three uh, athlete because it, it just means you know the sec always talks about it, it just means more yeah that's all good and well but you know i i think that that marries up a little bit better with the division three world because it does it just means more to the athlete you know you gotta i think it might be a little bit more blue collar you you gotta you gotta truly love the game because you're paying your way to play and you're paying your way to get up and at 6 a.m in the off season and, and, and go to work um you know go to work to to go try and win a football game in front of maybe two three four five thousand people instead of you know those those big boys doing it in front of a hundred thousand and you know, not having to, uh, you know, pay their way through school necessarily. So there's a pureness of the game at this level, and, and it's really a beautiful thing that I, I wish more people got to, um, I wish more people got to got to see and, and uh, experience. I do want to go back to the middle of this all, but to go off the D3, you just accepted a job at Marietta College, uh, NCAA Division Three, for to be the defensive backs coach. You played D3. We're talking about the importance and the love of the game of D3. Your dad is obviously connected to D3 in his history. What drove you to do this? Was it, you know, everything that you were just saying to say, you know what, I want to I wanna really just, you know, put put a mark on NCAA Division Three. I want to build it up. I want to give it a spotlight. Why did Marietta make sense for you? Yeah, that's a good question. Um the reasoning was all everything that I had just said and, and everything that you were you were hitting on there, um, and and Marietta itself, um, you know, through the interview process, I really got to get to know the head coach and Andy Waddle, the defensive coordinator Zach Feltrop, and um, um, and they are Marietta three itself, guys played um, Division three ball know, through the interview and process. For I really got years. to. Um, the way they know talk the about Marietta Waddle, College, the, the way they talk about the pride that they have in the program, talking to the athletic director, the, the, the alignment across the board of what they're trying to do here. Um, it, it was really cool to hear how much it, how much they love this place. And it reminded me of my time at Ithaca and the, and the way the people around the campus there talked about athletics. Um, and you know, I, that's what I was looking for. I want to be a part of something where there's alignment on campus. There is alignment within the athletic program. Um, and, and it's, it's, a it's truly a blue collar, uh, you know, work mentality, um, you know, pride and, and doing maybe more with less with all the right people, uh, aligned, um, you know, with, with the student athlete in mind and, and making this place the best place it can be because it's where we're all at. We're invested in it. We're not looking down the road to the next job or um, anything like that. It's, it's how can we 
make Marietta College the best it can be because it's our home. And, and that's what they were preaching through the interview process. And I fell in love with it. And I, you know, there's there's something to be said about that. You wake up with conviction to, um, you know, you want to you want to do your part to make this place the best it can be. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm week two of the job now. And, and, and that's held true. And it's it's really exciting getting up every day out of bed. Uh, you know, getting to go to work with these guys, you know, who, who believe so much in what they're doing here. So it's, it's been, it's been great so far. I'm very lucky to be here. Yeah, coming here from Wolfgang Schaefer uh, here on Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora this morning inside of the Cafe Kubal Studios. Uh, Wolf, for you to, you know, there's, there's so many different things to touch upon, but uh, you and I talked about it off the air, and I have, you know, never uh, shied away from this. I wrote an article uh, after everything happened uh, that was very, you know, to me, uh, it, it was it was a letter of gratitude to your father, to Scott Schaefer. And, you know, I got to meet, uh, through Scott, I got to meet your mom, Missy, obviously Elsa, you. I remember there's, like, unique things that I remember. I remember uh, being in a uh, press conference opportunity in the football wing and Scott was there and then uh, your mom and your sister came in and obviously you know I got to know your family uh, separately from everything so I went over to your mom and I was talking to her and she's like hey Dan how you doing and I was like good and we're talking and she and and she said uh, Elsa just uh just took her drive she, she took her driving test and I'll never forget that that she's like and I looked at Elsa and I was like how how'd she do and your mom kind of made a face and this and that and your dad came over and said hello but it, it's moments like that. It was uh, moments about, I remember, you know, like he would ask me like, are you married yet? Um, you know, he'd, he'd, he'd come over, but there, there was always really genuine moments with your father. And there, uh, I'll never forget, uh, there's a few of them, if you'd oblige me to tell them. Uh, one of them was when uh, there was a press conference, it was after a spring game, and there was all these cameras set up. There's like 30 people in an arch around Scott and I was over to I was over his left shoulder and my cousin was listening to the feed and I guess they turned on the feed before the press conference started and he goes did he just shout you out because your dad would would always everybody would be in there and he'd be quiet and he'd go up to the podium and then he'd look at me and he'd go hey Danny how you doing and always it was always hey Danny how you doing and um, when he got the job I remember walking down from from the uh, auditorium in the football wing and I went up to him just to say congratulations. And he grabbed me and he gave me a big hug and he said, thank you so much for being, he said, thank you for being here, Danny. I appreciate it. And then one of the games he came out of, I caught him coming out of the dome and he gave me a big hug and he grabbed me and he's like, we did it, Danny, we did it. And he grabbed my shoulders, he hugged me again and he grabbed my shoulders again. And and I just remember, I'm like, I would run through a wall for this guy. And the last time I saw him was when it was the last game he came out, he was emotional, the car was there, and he gave me a hug. Then he walked over, talked to a few people, uh, gave a hug or two, and then came over and gave me a hug. And I said, and before I could even say it, he said, I love you, Danny. And I said, I love you too, coach. And all of those moments just stick with me because he was one of the people that I genuinely rooted for in anything. If he wanted to be the best janitor in the world, the best pilot, the best actor, the best whatever. And, you know, I had so many moments with Scott that made me genuinely feel like uh, he knew what I was about, I knew what he was about, and it wasn't just about business. And, you know, I, I, I just, I don't know, I felt like I needed to share those with you because your father has touched my life in such a way that you know, I would do whatever I could to sit in a room with him again and, and just talk and not even about football, just talk about life because the the way he was there for me and how genuine he was and how he made me feel like he truly knew who I am, uh, that's something that I could never, I could never replace and, and I could never recreate in the same way. Yeah, no, I appreciate you sharing that with me. It puts a smile on my face and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm smiling ear, ear to ear here because, um, you know, that's who he is. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a proud, proud son. And, um, you know, that's just who he is. He'll, he'll never, 
not be that way. All the stuff that you saw throughout the years, like there was never any manuf- manufacturing of, of passion or, or, you know, he's just, he is who he is. And, um, you know, that's, that's what makes him my dad. And I'm, I'm proud, proud to be his son. It's, uh, you know, and, and my mom's the same way. My sister's the same way. Um, and, and, uh, you know, it's, we're, we're lucky to, um, you know, have him, um, kind of lead the way for us. And, um, you know, between him and my mom, they're, they're, they're very similar in that sense. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it, it was fun working for him the, the three years prior, um, because you know, I got to see that and the way he, he was with us young guys in the profession, us graduate assistants and quality control guys, just, he, he would he, he would always come in and, and sit down with us and you know have those real genuine conversation conversations with with all of us and to see see him do that with with different people whether it didn't matter where they were at on the hierarchy scale uh, he was always himself um, you know that was uh that was a really that was really cool to see so I appreciate you sharing those stories man yeah I mean he he's a he's a different human being for all the right reasons and he is is emotional and he is strong and he wears his heart on his sleeve and i will tell you that i know he's a fighter but i will also tell you something you already know your mother missy is a bull herself and and i loved loved and 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 i won't i don't even have to name any names or anything like that but if anything was ever written or he was ever misquoted in any way shape or form she was direct she was clear and I thought to myself, like, for the energy that he brings and the fight that he brings, your mom is a powerhouse herself, if people don't know that already. No, oh, no question. They're the ultimate one-two punch. Uh, you know, and my sister and I got that growing up as kids, and, and it was awesome. Um, they, they, are, they are the ultimate duo, and, and, you know, for a number of reasons. And my sister and I are very lucky to have, to have had that growing up because, uh, you know, you, you look at, what love is supposed to be and, and those two right there they feed off of each other very well and you know that's that's what true love looks like so you know we're, we're lucky to have that example growing up you know and, and you have a very unique name and your sister outside of like the movie frozen you know elsa and wolfgang not your typical things did you ever sit down with your parents and say where did these come from Oh yeah, yeah. I had to, especially you know, meeting people over the years. That's always one of the first questions: is how you got your name. I know for me, my parents wanted a uh, a unique name, and I think Wolfgang probably hits on the uniqueness, right? <laughs> yeah. um, and then they wanted a strong German name because my family comes from Ger- uh, German descent, so Wolfgang hit on those two. Um, you know, same, same, same idea with Elsa, unique and in, in, in German, and uh, you know, so that's. That's kind of where we got those, and um, it's uh, yeah, it's, it's funny now. You know, Leah and I are thinking about we talk about names for our kids down the road, and, and, and we definitely don't want um, you know any, anything anything common. With, you know, so I think I think um, my parents had some influence on that. So you know, and and that's the thing is now that you, I mean, having someone that you are getting ready to marry, I mean. She knows the life of a coach. You know the life of a coach. Your sister, your mom. Describe that because I'll never forget. You know Joe Adam, who's actually watching and listening right now. Uh, Joe's a really good friend of mine. We were on the phone yesterday, and and Joe, when we've spoken, it's it's funny because I'll tra- I travel a lot. I'll fly a lot. You know, all over the place, and I'll do a bunch of stuff. And then obviously, when you're recruiting and you're coaching and whatnot, you do the same thing. And there was a day where Joe, Joe was flying out of Detroit, and I flew into Detroit, and then I was flying out, and we had just missed each other by like I don't know an hour or two, and I was, and he's like, I got to do this, and I got to do this, and then I'm gonna go home for three days, and I got this, and he goes, Well, you get it, and I just, and you know, and, and in my life, you know, I I have been married and divorced, and it it wasn't because of travel, but you know, I, I just kind of realized that when you're in a life that you want to be in. And you in this coaching profession where you could go anywhere in the country, uh, you know, myself with running a company, you can go anywhere in the country, anywhere in the world. You know, there's the reality of you have to have a partner 
that gets it, supports it, appreciates it, respects it, knows that you would rather be in bed next to her more than anywhere else, and that, you know, if you had it your way, you'd be coaching, doing your thing, or I'd be out broadcasting, whatever, doing my thing, and then go right back uh, to that bed. Just just what you could say about what you need in a partner in the profession that's uh, in the world, the sports industry that you and I are in, knowing that our jobs may be different, but there's a certain calling that if you're a go-getter, in this profession, you're not always in your bed every single day, and that can put you in a place where things get tough unless you have the right partner. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's difficult, and you see it. Unfortunately, you see it broadcasted, you know, on uh, all the media outlets on, on a, at the at the larger scales of you get into the personal lives of, of, of different people in, in our professions and. Yeah. Um, you know, so yeah, there's a stigma there. I think, I think that it's all about prioritizing, and, and you know, for, for in my instance, you know, Leah, my fiance, knows the passion that I have for the game, and not just the game, but the relationships you build with the players and the players' families. Um, you know, so she she oh, understands the you know, there's the reality she sees of the passion you have to have a partner. In, in my talk instance, about you know, Leah, you know, my fiance knows the passion you know, the that I have with the player. We didn't talk any a lick of football. It was all about you know where they come from, their background, mentally where they're at, where they want to go in life, and um, she sees the beauty in that. Um, so she she understands my love and passion for it and it's not just my love and passion for it anymore it's it's hers she loves it she loves the investment in the kids and their families you know so it's a beautiful thing now that it's not just me it's it's us um and i think the most important thing too is is when you're when you are home and you do have that time you got to be all there with with your significant other you can't you can't be, you know, right side of the brain at work and left side of the brain with with her. You got to be all in, and, and if you can do that, um, I think there's there's an appreciation there, and, and you're really living in the moment, and that adds to it um, and, and gives credibility to the relationship. And you know, you said Joe Adams on, um, he's a great example. Him and Lisa, I mean, you talk about you talk about love, and, and obviously, you know, it's. It's different. I'm outside looking in, but um, I remember back in Syracuse and the way my dad and my mom talk about those two and, and seeing those two and their love. Like they've got it figured out, and it's never always perfect. But um, you know, there, there's something there. You can see it. You know, whether it's a recruiting weekend and you see the way those two interact. Um, you know, with with recruits, like there's there's that true family atmosphere, and it's because they have that um, you know solid foundation of love, um, and and it's hard. I'm I'm learning it as I go. It's hard to do, but I was lucky to be around a lot of really good people, uh, but you know, before me, um, to kind of see how how it's done, um, you know. But it goes back to prioritizing and 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 always letting you know. I tell Leah if there's ever a situation in time where can't do this anymore we gotta we gotta step back and kind of reroute and um, figure figure out what, what's important then yeah we'll do that so um you know that's there but I, you know i think she, and she'll tell you she, she never put me in that position or put us in that position because i think she knows that i'd never let it uh get there and and, and she also knows how much i you know i love this profession and, and love the kids and she feels the same way now so um it's difficult but but you make it work and you make it work because you, you fall back on on foundation of, of what love is and the, and the respect factor between you know me and her um you know so so it, it's been great so far it's made us closer it's made us have real conversations and get to know each other deeper um so it's it's, it's really become a beautiful thing you know and, and and how do you do it because i believe you can have it all wolf like i have always been you know somebody that i want to work with a lot of stuff there's a lot of things in my mind Uh, sports casting is but one tiny piece of my puzzle even though i've done it for you know over 17 years and how do you how do you have it all because i'm the type of person i don't know if you know this i mean i would i would gather that you know you've, you've gotten to know my personality a bit but you know people see me and they're like man you're everywhere you're doing all this stuff like are you ever home and, you know, you're doing this, you're doing that. It looks like you're busy. How'd you do all this during the pandemic and whatnot? And I appreciate that. But people that really, truly know me know that 
more than anything else in this world, I want to be a husband, I want to be a father, I want to have a family, and I want that genuine, real love. And I feel like God kind of hit my reset button and gave me a chance to do that the right way. But speak on that, because I believe you can chase your dreams and also have love, but I, I believe that as much as I love my career and I love everything about it, the person that ends up with me is going to be that much more above that, if that makes any sense. Yeah, no, it does. Um, I think the, the communication factor, right, and some of the stuff can be corny or cliche, but as you go through it, you kind of realize, well, shoot, I guess, you know, it's the cliche ness of it all is, is is true that's why they call it call it that um you know for leah and i just speaking on us i know the community it's always about the communication factor we 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 try and talk about everything um you know that's going through our heads whether it's you know issues or or dreams or goals and um you know every decision we make from there we, we, we try and fall back on what we've communicated about. So there's an openness between us and our relationship. So we, you know, if, 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 a, if a job comes open down the road or whatever it is, you know, I already kind of know, you know, I have my thoughts and where it can take me individually, professionally, you know, towards my goals and dreams. I have an idea, you know, what I'm looking for, but she, you know, she, she has an idea too, because we've already talked about it. You know, so if I'm ever in a situation where I'm trying to balance maybe a decision and I don't know where to go with it, um, I'm lucky because I can lean on her and she'll remind me about what I said a year ago or two years ago um, in the conversation maybe that we had, um, you know, a late night conversation that we had about where we want to see ourselves together uh, individually and then together and as a, as a future family, hopefully. Um, so, uh, you know, you got, if something comes up, you, you got to just talk about it, you know, if, um, and, and that's, that's worse for us so far. And we're at where we are, where we're at now because of all those open conversations. And, and I think, uh, you know, so far, so, so far, so good, so <laughs> far, so good. Um, obviously we're, we're young and, uh, we got a ways to go in our relationship. So, um, but we've always said, let's always fall back on communication and, and always be open and honest with each other. So, that's a big thing coming here from Wolfgang Schaefer uh, this morning on Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora inside of the Cafe Kubal studios. A lot of people uh, weighing in. Joe Adam, one of the best young coaches out there. Keep changing lives, Wolf. Uh, Joe Cor- Corley, a good friend of mine as well, head coach at West Genesee for football, said, I coached against Wolf and got to know his dad. What a great family. Uh, coach Hicks is on here appreciating uh, the time as well. You know, Syracuse, I, I know it's bittersweet for the family, but it's how I met you, it's how I met your dad, it's how I met Missy, it's how I met Elsa. You know, what What do you take from all of your time at Syracuse, one? And then two, uh, what do you take from the fact that, you know, you're in this crazy profession that, you know, and I mean in crazy in the sense of, like, you can get hired and fired and move around everywhere. Contracts sometimes mean something, sometimes they don't. So how, how do you, I mean... Question one kind of to this is, is, is what did you take away from Syracuse and, and everything that you experienced and that, you know, your family went through, but then the kind of like one a side of it is, you know, what made you want to want to go after it yourself, knowing everything your, your dad has been through good, bad, and in between. Yeah. Um, speaking on the Syracuse community and that experience, just, just for me personally, um, yeah, you know, the people, the people you talk about, you know, Joe Adam, Coach Hicks, Coach Corley, you know, Coach Corley, West Genesee, I mean, that, uh, some battles there, um, and what he's, what that program means, you know, I've kept in touch with some of the, uh, some of the guys who graduated, you know, from, from West Jenny and and that program, and the love that they have for Coach and that program, it just, it goes back to the people, right, you know, it's all about, it's not about where you're at, it's about the people that make up that place, Coach Adam already spoke on him and Lisa. Coach Hicks is one of the best people I know. Um, I, I was I was tight with his kids, um, and you know the, those people. You take those people out of it, and Syracuse is just the name of the city we were at. Those people are, are, are the people that um, you know that that made that made it home. People ask where I'm from. I say Syracuse, New York, and and I'm proud of that because of the the people that made that home. Um, so I'll. I'll be forever indebted to 
Syracuse. And when I say Syracuse, it's the people there. Um, you know, so so very th- we were very thankful to be be a part of that community, and I always call it home. Um, you know, jumping in the profession, it's all I've ever known, um, and I, I got to the relationships for me personally that I built through. Uh, you know, my dad, whether it's coaches or players or administrators, whatever it is, whoever it was, those are the reason. Those people are the reasons why I'm doing it now. Um, and 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 it's not always easy, but um, you know, there's good days and bad days in whatever you're doing. Um, and and but the but the good days and the bad days here, you know, at least at least you're working with people and helping, you know, helping build up people, empower them through positivity and tough love. And, discipline and accountability all those things that you get in in sports organizations and um you know that's what i want to do is it's education and it's education through sport and, and and trying to use sport as a vehicle um you know to teach life lessons and, and all the things that you hear coaches and, and and teachers and professors talk about um you know the, the, I, I was just very lucky to be around really good ones who were pure in their intentions and um, and strong in their belief systems and strong in their family values. Um, you know, so, so those are the reasons why I got into this thing and, and they're the reasons why I want to keep pushing on, um, towards, uh, carrying those, those values and those visions, um, and then those life lessons, um, you know, using, using the sport of football to do that, you know, so, um, it's those, those kind of, those answers that are kind of work off of one another, feed off of one another. And it all goes back to being around good people, you know, in our second to last piece here, best advice you've ever gotten from your dad, your mom, and your sister. So one piece of advice from Scott, Missy, and Elsa. Yeah, that's 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 good. There's a lot of it. I, starting with my dad, he always said uh, he always said everything in life is overrated except your faith in your family, um, and I've taken that with me everywhere I go. Um, that, that's that's number one. Um, you know, my sister, I would have to say with her, she always just tells me to, to be, be you. Um, you know, so anytime I feel lost or off the beaten path, you know, she'll, she'll kind of bring me back and tell, tell me to be, be myself. Um, and, and my mom, it's, it's, uh, I wouldn't even say there was one piece of advice from my mom, but just how she's always shown unconditional love, like, no matter what, she's always there, and she's she's the biggest fan. Um, and so I think for her, it's just not even a piece of advice. It's through action, um, everything that she's done for me as a, as a mother to, to for Elsa and I, through action, showing unconditional love, has, has been the best advice because it's it's what I want to do for the kids I'm I'm working working with, and, and hopefully down the road the, the the children that we and I have have together just provide that unconditional love and, and unwavering support. Um, so it's it's a beautiful thing. Very lucky to have those three in my corner. Yeah, you know, and I definitely you know can tell you that uh, from my perspective, you. You definitely got the luck of the draw when God made a decision on what family you were coming into. And, you know, it's it's been incredible. And, and I just had uh, Joe Adam, Bobby Acosta, DeAndre Smith, Fred Reed, and Tim Lester come on and do a show together, getting a band back together. Uh, the first time that they've all kind of been in the same room virtually or literally uh, since, since Syracuse. What can you say about that staff? They speak highly of you. And, you know, not just your dad, but of you, uh, they've all had kind words to say. And, you know, in my opinion, Scott put together a fantastic staff. The proof is in the pudding. They're all successful, and they're all in the profession doing great things all over the country. What do you think about that staff of just really genuinely good men? Yeah, I think um, I think they had a lot of fun together. And it's like you said, it's the good men, right? The good fathers, the good husbands. You know, you don't get that everywhere. Um, you really don't get that everywhere, and, and it's it's special when you do bring those those pieces to the puzzle together. Um, it's one thing to be a, a good football coach, but it's 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 more important to be a good man. And um, if you can bring the two together, you got really something special because it's you know the the wins and the losses. You know those will come and go, um, but building up a program the right way. Um, you know, you're trying to do, you're trying to develop young men to to become great men. And so, when you get guys who are, you know, walking the walk, um, 
like a lot of those guys on staff there do. Um, you know, I, I think you get to look at those kids four or five years down the road plus and, and see what they see what they do with their lives and the lessons that they they took from uh, you know from the, the guys on staff there and it ends up being a pretty a pretty cool thing um, you know so I, I I was lucky to be around those guys often and it's really awesome seeing where they're at and what they're doing with their families and, and, and their professional lives so very very fortunate very lucky to have been around those guys. Last piece here, Wolf. Uh, you know as a coach that you get questioned. You've seen your dad stand at a podium and be asked questions and never get to ask them himself. So in the spirit of fairness here on Wake Up Call, I do a thing called rapid fire. It gives me the opportunity to flip the script on myself and take a seat as a broadcaster and let you take the microphone. Four questions, anything in the world. I know I didn't tell you about this because I wanted it to be fluid. But you can ask me anything. You can ask four questions. Doesn't matter what they are. It doesn't have to do with football or uh, sports. Could be about literally anything. But I'm going to put myself on the hot seat. And I want you to remember this when you're sitting at a podium someday. Remember, and, and I want you to look at that person that maybe doesn't ask you a fair question. And I want you to look at them and go, you know what? I'm going to flip the script. I'm going to ask you about it too. So... Go ahead with uh, rapid fire. Four questions, anything you want. I, I feel like uh, coaches deserve this opportunity when you never get it. Yeah, pressure's on. Um, <laughs> no, well, you know, flipping the script. I, I, fairness, you've always been one of the good ones because you, you always were fair and positive. Um, Try to look at the human human being before the coach. So I won't I won't be too hard on you. But uh, um, I guess I guess first one that I, I always think about. Um, is, is why did you get into the profession that you chose? Why 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 do you want to why do you want to jump in and uh, you know open up the uh, open up the lives of, of, of coaches and athletes? What made you want to do that? I appreciate the question. You know, I I always in my life uh, since I was like really when I remember my first memory of of writing down my thoughts because I always had a bit of big imagination. Uh, my first memory of it is uh, five years old at the kitchen table, you know, kind of like standing. I was so, I was so small. So getting up on the chair and, you know, just kind of like kneeling there, standing and, and typing on my dad's word processor, which I have in my office at this giant typewriter that has this little tiny screen on it, which made it like this genius thing because you could actually see what you were typing. And I remember writing a, a story and I just, I've always loved being a storyteller. I, I believe in love over everything. Uh, my faith in God is, is more important to me than, than anything in the world. And, and I believe that true love comes from God and you'll never be uh, in the wrong direction if you trust in that. And I just, to me, bringing people that, bringing people that genuine, true, real, like this is who I am. You know, I, I, I always wanted to do that. I always wanted to bring people truth and positivity and goodness and, and make them laugh and get them to think because I, I want the world to be, you know, the best that it possibly can be. And the coaches and the players, you guys come into it, you know, your dad comes into it because I love telling stories. I love getting to know people. Uh, you know, I, and, and, I think that thing, it's funny how I got in to tell stories and I got in because of the passion and just being a fan as a kid. And, you know, the kid in me is like, oh my God, you get to speak to the head coach. You're friends with Scott. You get to, you know, go talk to him and arm in arm and on the side when nobody's, you know, uh, broadcasting anything. And so like that to me is always like something that I love is building the relationships. But then what it became kind of on top of it is, you know, you see that 99.9% .9 of the media doesn't tell the truth. There's always an angle. They don't care. They talk to people, but they're always looking for a story. They tell you they care. I mean, I, I've i seen somebody put their arm around a coach's wife and lie to her and then write a story that was just vile. And I remember standing there going, that's not what any of those, that entire conversation had nothing to do with that. So, you know, I think for me, I got into it because I have a passion for helping people and bringing people together and making people smile. And another part of it is being a part of the 0.1% that wants to make sure that everyone's story is told correctly the first time and that there is no angle. It's just their life that they were willing to share with me and that I have the deep gratitude and respect that they gave that to me. So I give it to the world. 
untouched, unscathed, and as true as I can possibly give it. Yeah, well, that's that's the way it should be. I appreciate the way you go about it, man. There's there's something to be said about that, Thank especially you. this day and age, like like you said. Um, all right, on a lighter scale, all right, who's who's the best quarterback of all time in the NFL? Doesn't matter. You give me who who's the best to ever do it. Well, in your opinion. Okay. Well, I know I know that the people that listen and watch this show. I, I'll tell you this, Wolf. I, on Twitter alone a year or so ago, got no less than 500 angry tweets when I said that I didn't think Tom Brady was necessarily the GOAT. And I can tell you now that going to a 7-9 and nine Bucks team with a quarterback that threw as many touchdowns as he threw interceptions, uh, going to that team... And bringing them to a championship in his first 44, then 43 years old without Bill Belichick. I, I just told my dad on the phone, I said, listen, there is no question whatsoever. I know one of my listeners will say, Dan, this is three weeks in a row that you called him the GOAT. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I think Tom Brady, 70% of the time he wins when he's in the championship game. He's been to 10. He's won seven, which is more than any NFL total franchise so I don't think there's anybody you can call better by any stretch of the imagination at this point. He has, you know, gotten me to say it after all these years. And I think the, you know, arm strength, we could talk about different things and whatnot. But, you know, to be somebody that changed an entire city, an entire franchise and did it in less than a year, I, I don't. There's, I mean, what else can you say? He's, he's yeah, I'm, I'm right there with you, man. There's, it's, it's tough to dispute that now. Yeah. Um, so I've been I've been getting into reading more and more here. Uh, I've been trying to do more reading. And I just finished up a really good book, uh, Green Lights, the, the Matthew McConaughey uh, book that he had just come out with recently. Highly recommended. Do you have? I'm looking for the next book. Do you do you have one that you'd recommend? Uh, I would tell you that I just bought a bunch and over time and I keep thinking I gotta finish them uh, and start some of them but I, I bought one about Robin Williams you know I, I grew up around you know I just always watched Mork and Mindy is the first live action uh, show on TV I remember watching I grew up on Mrs. Doubtfire I was little and I just really genuinely Felt like I got so close to his comedy and, and like everything that I possibly could uh, connect with with him that when he passed away, it really felt like I lost an uncle. So I bought I bought the uh, book of his to kind of learn a little bit more about his life. And I can honestly tell you I haven't picked it up because I'm a little uh, nervous about it because if it really dives into his pain, I know that uh, I've already kind of like felt that for him, kind of reading some other stuff because I am one of those people that kind of feels pain of others and, and I can sense stuff. And so I've kind of shied away from it just because I, I feel sad for him, but I do want to read that. And I, I crystal who I found out Billy crystal and, and I have a lot in common, which is cool. A lot of things that he likes and does and kind of stories that, that seem to work out in the way that God works in your life. So he's, he's got a book called still fooling them. And, um, that's a good one to read. It's a little bit older, and then I need to read my uh, Bob Iger book about you know his connection to Disney and uh, and everything he's done there. That's uh, that's another book that I'm kind of in on. But I will tell you the best thing that I've read, which is a bunch of short chapters that have really great advice. And I write notes all over the book. And I can honestly tell you that this book has changed my life for the better. Is a book called Don't Sweat the Small Stuff, and it's all small stuff. That's that's probably a, a fantastic book if you're ever having a tough day. Yeah, I'll have to look into that. I have to throw out there, you know, Bob Iger's a college grad, don't you? You know, I you know, I I don't know about him like other people do, so I did not know that. I did. Yeah, there's a fun little tidbit. Bob Iger's a uh, is, is a bomber baby, so. There you go. See. So definitely, you and I should both read that book then. <laughs> yeah, I gotta get on that. Yeah, no doubt. All right, last one. Yeah. I'm just curious. Do you? Use. Uh, you just you just cut out. What did you say? Uh, do you ever see yourself leaving Syracuse? I find that the timing of this question, and Joe is probably sitting with a cigar right now, laughing his butt <laughs> off. So. Uh, <laughs> 
I can, you know, God has come to me during my show in such a way these this this last I don't know week and a half it's uncanny, but I will tell you that I love my hometown. I started my company here eight and a half years ago, and building it here it will always have a place. And basically, whatever I build, I just add to. So I don't take away from anything I built. But if you're asking me that if there's something in life that would make me think about elsewhere, yes, there is. Well, that's good. Yeah, life's too short to get stuck in one place. But yeah. obviously, I think we feel the same. This is very similar on uh, you know what Syracuse is and what it means to us. But oh, that's that's good stuff. I appreciate you letting me flip the script on you, man. Uh, pray you, get, you put the pressure on me there. <laughs> Uh, you know, I put the pressure on you to put the pressure on me. So, yeah. in all in all fairness, I think it worked out. But you know, I have in uh, shout out to DeAndre Smith, Not who's on man. here as well. Uh, pretty, but I, I have uh, the <laughs> uh, you know I put the pressure on you to put the pressure you, on me. Uh, I know, so, yeah. and I know that uh, you know it's been a while since I've seen any of you, including uh, Dad, uh, and and I I hope that I get to talk to 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 Scott soon. Please send him my love and to Elsa and to Missy. Um, you know, I I genuinely miss more than anything else uh, the conversation that i got to have with your dad probably when we were in an airport both on a layover but uh you know which was detroit ironically going back to joe adam but uh, i just um i i cannot tell you how much your family has meant to me how true you guys have been how kind you have been and after all these years that uh, that when i asked you to come on the show you said yes so you know, I, I hope that one day, you know, I get to be around the Schaefer family in its entirety. And I am so grateful that uh, right now that I get to speak with you. And, and I hope that you and I can continue to build our friendship, continue to build positivity and be there for each other if we need it. And, and I just genuinely respect you and am, am very, very grateful that you uh, that you let me do this today. Well, thanks for having me on, Dan. You're like I said, you're one of the good ones, and appreciate the way you handle handle business uh, and doing things the right way. And I, you know, to everybody on here who, who I know and uh, who left a mark on on me and my family and, and Syracuse community, really appreciate you guys. Um, we talk about you as a family all the time. Um, and if, if we could, if we picked up the phone and called called you guys. Every time we thought about you, uh, we, we'd probably be spending too much time on the phone. So thanks for thanks for everybody uh, you know who made our time in Syracuse great. And Dan, again, thanks to you for having me on and, and, and catching up, man. It's it's been too long. Hopefully, we can talk again soon. Absolutely. And now now I got a reason to pay attention out there with Marietta because uh, the the defensive backs I'll be eyeing that up in the team itself. But Wolf, you you know you're good people. You're a good kid, and I'm I'm very very grateful that whatever we started back then has continued to today and it means the world to me your kind words so thank you for that and god bless you as always and as your dad said everything else is overrated except for your faith and your family so keep that strong and know that uh, i'll be here if you need me yeah i appreciate you dan god bless you and, and you have a great one man i appreciate you all right man take care all right you too see you back coming once again from wolfgang schaefer here on wake up call with dan tortora where sports meets that beautiful thing called life. We'll take a step aside for a fast break, and when we come back, we will be here with Roosevelt Bowie Jr. to speak on Syracuse basketball and so much more inside of the Cafe Kubal Studios. Avicoli's Restaurant, located right at the corner of Route 57 and Wetzel Road, is proud to be your local neighbor, growing with you for over 20 years. We're open seven days a week for lunch, dinner, and drinks. For takeout, delivery, or catering, call us at 315-622-5100. When you order online and use our promo code AVS10, you will save 10% on your online purchase at myavicolis.com. And make sure to join us monthly for our live on-site broadcasts centered around Liverpool Athletics. Avicoli's, your local, trusted neighbor right at the corner of Route 57 and Wetzel Road.
having peace of mind when you're out of town that your furry loving friend is safe and sound means taking them to canine campground because we all know that when it comes to the love of our pets it goes well beyond the call of duty to make sure they're safe and sound right lily so take a ride to 242 johnson street in east syracuse new york and see canine campground and where your dog will be staying in the classic cabin the executive cabin the grand cabin or of course the luxury cabin because if you know lily you know she loves luxury now you don't have to wait to the last minute to find a family member or a friend that'll take your dog for a few days. Call Canine Campground at 315-299-4013. That's 315-299-4013. Their drop-off and pick-up times are Monday through Sunday. Check caninecampground.com for more information. That's the letter K, the number 9, and campground spelled with a K, dot com. Caninecampground.com. When you're going out of town, bring your dog to Canine Camp around. Trapper's Pizza Pub, located on 5950 Butternut Drive in East Syracuse. Right off of Bridge Street is your local community supporter right around the corner. Join us on site at Trapper's Pizza Pub for our live monthly broadcast supporting Central New York student athletes and their sports programs. Call 315-438-4444 for more information. And find us on Facebook and Instagram at Trapper's Pizza Pub. Trapper's Pizza Pub, your local community supporter right around the corner. Welcome back here to Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora on WakeUpCallDT.com, your one-stop sports shop, and on MixLR.com backslash WakeUpCallDT. Once again, here inside of the Cafe Kubal Studios, happy to be here with you on Wake Up Call. Like I said, on MixLR.com backslash WakeUpCallDT, and on WakeUpCallDT.com is where you're listening, you're watching on Facebook Live on Facebook.com backslash LiveNowDT, and on YouTube.com backslash WakeUpCallDT. DT. So, however you're tuning into the show, thank you so much for connecting with us. Very happy here inside of MonPazPopcorn.com's What's Poppin', bringing you the list of topics for the day and special guests. We are now at that time where Roosevelt Bowie Jr. is rejoining the show. Rosie is no stranger to the broadcast by any stretch of the imagination. He's been with us plenty of times, and uh, we built a friendship over the years. It's been many years that I've known him, known Dale, known Gene, and so on and so forth, and so it means the world to me that I have the opportunity to connect with Roosevelt Bowie Jr., not just as a former Syracuse basketball player and international player, but also as a friend and someone who it's just good to catch up with and see how he's doing. So with that being stated, let's bring the man in of the hour, Mr. Roosevelt Bowie Jr. Rosie, how are we doing today? I'm doing great, Dan. How are you doing? I'm doing well. And, and, and listen, man, I miss you. I mean, I know you're not that far away, but... You know, no bit, nobody in the dome and this and that, whatever not going on. You and I haven't seen each other in a bit. So, how have you been? And do I still have the height advantage over you? Yeah, the height advantage you do no, you no longer have unless you're standing <laughs> at the top of the dome and I'm on the floor. <laughs> but uh, I've been, uh, I live, I'm, I'm on the great metropolis of Kendall, which is uh, somewhere around 1,500 people in about a 20 square mile. Uh, region so we got a lot of deer and animals running around out here where it is very very easy to social distance yeah it's a way of life (laughs) you know and and that's so you were social distancing before social distancing Uh, how have you taken this you know this this past year teaches a lot you and i always uh, go well beyond the world of uh, sports and Everybody that watches and listens to the show knows that and reads anything that I do or pays any attention to Wake Up Call knows that it's where sports truly meets life. Uh, For you, what can you say about this past year and what it's taught us or maybe what it what it at least should have taught us? Well, you know, the the first thing I always had to go back to um, had to go back to my basics. So I'm uh, I'm still that guy that uh, decided to go play in Italy when it was not very popular uh it was a great 
great league, but everybody was kind of afraid to go over there. And I, uh, at age 22, two weeks after graduation, I picked up everything and I was sitting on the shores of the Adriatic getting ready to start my professional career. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm not new to sacrifices, so I was able to uh, get through that. So I just said, you know what? Hey, roll up your sleeves, get ready, and go go do this. So um, two things that, that really helped, you know, you got to have your faith. You got to trust in God. You got to understand that things happen for a reason. And you got to go out there and, and put one foot ahead of the other. So during my time that I was uh, here at home, you know, I didn't want to end up like Jack Nicholson and Shining, like, here's Johnny, because you, <laughs> yeah. you don't go nutty out here, but, um, so what I did is I took my time, and I did a few broadcasts on, uh, on Twitch, and then on, uh, on Facebook, and I t- just talked about just normal things going on, and, and the benefits that I was able to stay in contact with a lot of my friends, and, and friends and family, and people that we knew, and the, uh, the ability to video stream was upgraded and became like a, a norm. So that was great. And then I had the epiphany that I said, you know what? I, I was able to uh, be a professional basketball player and it was fantastic. But uh, realistically, I was doing something probably uh, eight, eight years before I actually started playing basketball at age 14. I actually started fishing at age six. So it's kind of been my passion. So I've been working on a program so that I can teach fishing pretty much like a college course. Like uh, you have, you're fishing 101 straight through to fishing 501 where we actually show you how to locate a, an inexpensive aluminum boat and actually rebuild it into a nice bass boat. So I've been keeping myself busy. Yeah, and that's and that's such a great thing that you take, you've take. you taken this time to not only do something to pass your time, but something that passes your time but does it with something you love and connects you to you know people and to helping people so just what you could say about that you know that that you've taken this time to get more creative to get those you know creative juices flowing and to figure out you know what you like what you enjoy and then to not just hoard it for yourself but to share it with other people i mean that's it's it's a multi-layered lasagna that you got going on over there and tell me about that well you know what the the funny thing was i started like any given time during the summer, I will fish. Probably, t- I'll go. Co- I'll go a couple of day- a couple of days during the week, and uh, that's on an average an average summer. So I started noticing that I was fishing four to five days a week. I mean, I would go four or five times like previously, which would be a couple hours, and I come back. I would like leave in the morning, and I come back at dusk, you know, at least four days a week. And as I was doing it. You know, I was like saying, well, this is, I started noticing that I was not as stressed. I was pretty, pretty even keeled. And I said, you know what? People that are like sitting in their homes and all locked up and don't have that opportunity. um, You know, I was out there fishing and then a a beaver would swim up or or a fox would run by. And they had absolutely nothing to do with me. They just looked at me and kept on going. So I, I would take pictures and put them up and post them. So it was a chance to get out to nature. And I said, you know what, they're in the, in, just in the Syracuse area. In upstate area, there's so many great fishing spots. Um, why not uh, show people how to uh, how to enjoy it? Yeah, you know, and and for you, I mean, how how has that been, and how has the feedback been of being able to share something you love with people that love it as well? Well, actually, the the first thing I did, I spoke to a, a gentleman that uh, was a marketer for one of the major fishing companies, and he said, "Listen, he said I love the idea. It's fantastic." He said, "But a lot of people have great ideas." He said, you got to be able to put it down into paper, make it into a course, and then make it marketable and come back to me, and I, you'll have all kinds of support. Um, and so that's basically what I've been doing, just putting it into like a business plan form. Um, I'll be affiliating myself with the program. will be a, a program that I'm putting together, but I will be working uh, together with uh, non-for-profits. And the first thing that I was told when I was uh, talking to a, a grant writer, she said, um, Roosevelt, listen, please, please tell me that you're just not going to focus on one city because this is something that's that's greatly needed throughout throughout the state and possibly throughout the country if you can organize it. So that got me really excited. and I've been just running around, uh, just getting myself organized, hooking up with some people that can help me. And and where do you see this going, Rosie? I mean, what's what's kind of your, your thought and your hope, you know, your big game plan for all this? 
big game plan is kind of is like this: you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day; teach a man to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. So if you just got if you just got your kids and you want to show them how to you know go out and have a good time either on the shore with a worm and a pole. Or if you want to learn the actual basics of fishing off a boat or uh, the, the electronics, how to launch a boat, just everything from A to B. And I, listen, I, I've been doing it probably, let me see, I've got over 20 nieces, nephews, great nieces, and nephews. And each and every one of them, I came back home and I took them out to help them catch their first fish. And the excitement that I see out of them, it's, it's life changing because now all, all, of, all of them, if I want to see them, all I got to do is call them and ask them when they're going to come fishing with uncle. And they will bother their parents for the next 20 hours until they bring them out and we go fishing. So it, 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 it really opens up their horizons. You know, we're talking about kids that love to stay inside and play with their video games and their iPads. And all I have to do is call them and ask them if they want to go fishing and they will run outside and stand next to the car. So I, I, it's, I, th- I feel it's something that if I could get it to everybody, I would try to sit down and organize and try to figure out how to do it. It's great. So, I mean, can we see these Roosevelt, Bowie Jr. Tor- tutor- you know, like, uh, tutorials around the world, around the country, about fishing, about the passion for it and the love for it? I mean, from basketball to fishing, I mean, I know how much you have a passion for fishing, you know, I, I, because we've talked about it such a long time ago. But, I mean, could we see this, like, second coming of roosevelt buoy where we really just get to see this 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 deep passion of yours and and people you know just start you know they turn it on they they watch it they get a feel for it and and they get to connect with it i mean it seems like something that could really turn in i I don't know i mean i i can feel the passion over the phone that you have for it so i'm kind of i mean to me i'm i'm excited about the fact that you know we could be watching you uh, do yet another huge thing in the world that's vastly different from basketball, and at the same time, you know it, it shows people your personality and kind of what you're all about. Well, you know the the funny thing is that my uh, my grandmother took me out when I was about six years old to go fishing, and I was uh, I was a little tool. I was always getting into stuff. I was <laughs> I was I was busy, so I was getting scolded often because I was a little distracted. She took me out fishing for the first time. And I came back and I caught a fish and she was like, oh, look what my baby did. And I was like, wow, I got praised. And then from that point on, I was like, yeah, this is what I need to do. So I started fishing. And then uh, by the age of 10, 11 years old, I could literally get up at the crack of dawn, leave the house with my fishing pole and my little little bucket and come back with a bucket of fish at the end of the day. So I got responsibility. uh, It kept me focused. And it's something that I'm very passionate about. And uh and when you find things that you're passionate about, like we're talking to a gentleman now to 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 market it. We're talking uh, with someone else about putting it into a program, an online program. So there'll be an online portion. There'll be an in-person portion. And um, listen, if there's water close to you, you'll be hearing from me soon. I love that. If there's water close to you, you'll be hearing from me soon. That should be the tagline, Rosie. I mean, if there if there's water close to you, you'll be hearing from me soon. Does that mean that Dale Shackelford will be hearing from you soon? Because he showed me what it looks like outside of his porch. Hey, listen, there was, uh, I talked to, and this also happened a couple years ago. I've always been toying around with the idea. A couple years ago, uh, Shaq came out and he, we, we did a little fishing derby here. Uh, Dennis Duvall and his children came and friends, and then Dale came out. And, and some of my family, we, we went out salmon fishing. We had a great time, but it was just when we had the really high water, so there wasn't a, wasn't I wasn't able to organize it as large as I wanted to be. But I accidentally put out a text that I was going out fishing with uh, with Dale and uh, and Dennis. I've got a group text with a bunch of what about thirty SU alumni. Yeah, and we kind of you know talked back and forth. And I accidentally put something out there. I'm about to go fishing. I'm having this tournament. And, and then Derek, Derek Coleman hits me back and he goes, yeah, Rosie, let me know because, you know, I, you know, I know how to fish. And Billy Owens said, what do you know about fishing? You're from Detroit. <laughs> and, then, and then Derek said, Rosie knows I'm from down south and we know how to fish. So we got this whole thing going on. Uh, Howie Trish has been out to my house a few times fishing with his son. Um, and I went up fishing with Howie. So the, the whole group of guys, and Etan has told me time and time again, Etan Thomas, he wants to bring his son out so that, that we can take him out, so I can take him out fishing. So he's just waiting for the right time and the right uh, atmosphere. So it's going to be something that uh, we all like. And I'm not going to mention the fact that Coach Beheim, um 
we used to fish once a once a once a year. Yeah. Uh, so he called me up and he's like, "Yeah, but can I? We go out with your guide." So I had this, this friend of mine that would guide, and I would call him, and we'd go out and we fish, and uh, that used to, that happened for about four years, and then uh, I believe it was when when Buddy started started school there because the boat I go out on it's you can take there's the, the driver and then two passengers, right? Well, I started noticing that uh, I started getting phone calls from my guide, Coach Beheim, and Buddy. Yeah. Uh, I got cut out of the picture, so I had to call <laughs> friend of the guide. I was like, how does this work? It's my guide. Yeah. He's fished all the time. And now he says, well, you know, Buddy likes to fish too. So uh, I got passed over there. So I said, no problem. I got another Buddy. And this is where I got the initial idea from. His name is Guy Crump. He was a professional fisherman. And he was talking about how he was, uh, how there's this, there's so many business opportunities around fishing and, and college scholarships down south and all of this. I was like, hmm. and just think we don't, the only reason I know about fishing is because I grew up right next to Lake Ontario, but somebody that doesn't know about it, you introduce it to them and it just opens up lots of doors and you can be outside and, and the marketing and the products. And, I mean, I just don't get me started. I'll just start drooling. <laughs> You know, and, and I mean, you got to, like you said, you got to be out there with Coach Beheim. Uh, what was that like? How does he, how does he fish? And 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 what do you think about the fact that you know he, you get that call from your guide saying, "Hey, I'm out here with with Buddy and Jim," and you're going, "Okay, well that's <laughs> that's nice, guys." <laughs> no, no, I, actually, I, actually, I do, but yeah, I, so I got that call. It was kind of funny. It was nice going out and fishing with Coach Beheim because we just uh, we were just fishing, two guys fishing from upstate. Yeah. So we're out there fishing, talk to very little about basketball because we, you know, we're out there just enjoying enjoying being outside. And I, I like the fact that uh, the buddy likes to fish too because uh, you know it lets you know what kind of character you got, patience and whatnot. Yeah. But the funny thing is, so I I don't really take it personal. It took me about fifteen minutes to find another guy. <laughs> so what I what I've always done is uh, whenever I catch a big fish, I take a picture of it. And I send it to the basketball office to the, to um, to one of the assistants there, the, the 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 ladies that work there. And I'm like, listen, print this out, and print this out real big, and slip it under the papers. Just let the corner hang out under in Coach Beheim's office under under the under his paperwork so when he comes in, and he'll see it sticking out. He'll pull it up. So that's how, that's my way to get back. So so how many times have you sent pictures of the fish you caught and had the the women uh, send it over to Jim Beheim and leave it in his office? Well, eh, probably three or four times and then the, the other times I uh, the other times I would just send a picture of a, a big fish coach would send back where'd you buy it you know the, the same the same uh, you know the same humor but the uh, the funny thing is once uh, so one time he's out, He's out with my with my buddy fishing, and they're sending me pictures of these all these big fish. And so I was at a, I was at a charity golf tournament. So so I was like I was like uh, so I sent him I sent him back a picture. So one of the one of the beautiful women that was walking by says, "Excuse me, will you take a picture with me?" And she said yes. And I took a picture of this beautiful young lady with my arm around her, and I texted back to him. I was like, "Yeah, coach, you won." <laughs> so, so we kind of we kind of have fun with it. So, so, so I, I mean, I think it's pretty safe to say, texting wise and idea wise, you're you're outsmarting uh, Bayheim right now. I think you, I think you got based on what you've told me just now. I think you're a leg up on on, on Jim Bayheim right now. Well, I, I get a chance to go out fishing more than he does, and uh, so I got to be creative about how to uh, you know get my get my pictures to him, but. No, it's just it's all in good fun, and we have we have we have, we have fun at it. I know he and Buddy they they went out and they had a great time with um with my friend there. Uh, they fish all we fish, normally fish Oneida Lake, so just think Oneida Lake is it's one of the best game fishing lakes in, in the country. Is right outside of Syracuse. Yeah, you know, and I think my dad brought me out there when I was a kid, and I haven't gone in forever. And you know, I I've wanted to go out fishing for a long time, so. You know, you know, Rosie. Maybe, maybe it's maybe you know since since Jim vacated that spot, you know, maybe maybe I need to take that spot and come out and fish with you a little bit because I have been wanting, I've been itching to fish since I was a kid. So if you'll have me, it would be nice to go out there and do it. You can definitely do it. And I, I knew I was onto something because I'd been talking to. I've got my minority business status in the city of Syracuse. I've been talking to uh, 
uh, the gentleman there in town, and when I was like, he said, I, I said I wanted to do trainings, you know, and I, he talked about trainings, business trainings, and whatnot. And then I, uh, and I said to him, I was like, you know what, I'd like to do a training on fishing. And when I started to explain it to him, his eyes started lighting up. And uh, I mean, I've talked to, uh, I've talked to, um, first I talked to uh, Dennis Duval, and Dennis said, uh, listen, let me that I want to do it, and I want to do it for you know. Uh, to start out with underprivileged kids, get them out, show them how to do it. It's something they can do very easily, very inexpensively. We've talked to uh, Bass Pro Shop, and they have this thing called a, a, a rod give back, where people turn in old fishing rods and stuff like that. And and they they've said that uh, we were most welcome to have some of those some of those items. So I think the the, the people that are the people that have heard about the project are really excited about it. Are definitely willing to uh, they're stepping up to the plate and making so we can make this happen. Yeah, you know, and I look forward to it, and I look forward to seeing everything they're going to bring forward because I know you have a passion for it, and I know you have a personality, and and I know that you know you put passion and personality together, and anything can be possible. So speaking here with Roosevelt Bowie Jr., Syracuse Orange men's basketball alum, and also. Uh, someone who is diving into the world of a, a lot of different things, including uh, the world, you know, bringing the world of fishing to you. As he said, if there's a body of water near you, you'll be hearing from him soon. So, Rosie, to uh, to go back to the basketball side of things, for you, what have you taken away from this season in the sense of a, what does the team look like to you? But then also b, what does the college climate look like to you? playing through Corona, seeing Bayheim wear a mask, seeing the fact that the coaches are all, you know, totally spaced out, the media, we're spaced out, there's nobody in the Dome. So what are your thoughts on the season in and of itself of, of how the team is actually playing? And then secondly, what are your thoughts on the fact that they had a season amidst all of this uniqueness, I guess I'll call it? Well, you know, I, I, I'm i glad that they had the season. I'm glad it got started with to get back to a uh, semblance of normalcy. But the one thing that I'm, uh, you know, I figured if, if there's any, any group that's able to control their environment to the best of their ability, it's that, it's that, it's that group because they have their, they have a fantastic facility. They have all the best uh, doctors affiliated and trainers affiliated with them. So who could best do it? I, Cause I remember thinking when I first heard about it, I was thinking about when we went, uh, when I was, when I was playing uh, over 30 years ago, over 40 years ago when I was playing that even at that point I started imagining it would have been able we would have been able to isolate ourselves with the technology that they had back then and because we're always uh, we're always strictly followed by uh, our, our trainers uh, trainers our doctors and our coaches so there's nobody that knows these kids better than their trainers doctors and coaches except their parents so that's a good group of a good group of people to be with so you get them in there They'll have the motivation. It's a small enough group, so they'll have the motivation. They'll be responsible for trying to to make things to make this season happen because they really want to play. So I was glad to see it get started. Uh, I'm very sorry for the the players that have been doing it ever since they got to Syracuse because the biggest one of the biggest things that I enjoyed about going to Syracuse University was the Syracuse University fans and the other students that I went to school with. That was. Um, that was that was a huge part of my of my of my college life. Um, I didn't get to, to go out a lot and do a lot of crazy things, but during the summertime, I stayed up to Syracuse, and there were a lot of students that would stay. So I got to live that that college life around college students. That's something that they're not getting. Um, the other thing about the fans, I mean, the fans in in, in Manly Fieldhouse, it, they were so loud that I I remember thinking on numerous occasions, I'm so happy that I came here. So I didn't have to face these. Just, they were the best, uh, the best fans in the world because you didn't always have to win, but they always supported you. So I think we're we're getting a little spoiled now because we're you know Coach Beheim has brought has brought the level of basketball at Syracuse so high, and the, the newer fans are expecting perfection. Well, that's the thing about basketball is it's not it's not a game of perfection. It's being able to take what you have and turn it into something special. So um, that's what they're doing. And these guys, my hat's off to uh, the, the players this year because because they they have to stay focused, they have to stay ready, and at the drop of a hat, they can be dealt something and they've got to 
go into a pause, train themselves individually, and then get back together and put. So there's going to be a lot of ups and downs. So for the and for the season overall, I think that it's very important the team that can stay focused, the team that can can stay on task, the team that can be flexible and adjust to these situations. Like there, it makes me laugh when I hear somebody talk about well the team didn't win big or the team didn't win. They should have beat this team. There is no, there is no given. I played, I played basketball for 21 years, and I can tell you every year there was some team that did, that either didn't win a game, went got down to the last game and beat one of the better teams, one of the better teams in, in, in the country that I was playing in. So that's why they call it March Madness because once you get there. There is there is no set rules. Once you get there, any any number of fifteen teams can win. So stay focused, stay diligent on on your preparation, and believe in your coach, and uh, you can have a lot of fun. Yeah, you know, and and I think that you know that's the thing is like you said, you know, anybody can win. I think this year has really shown that. Because because it's been so unique in the start and stop and everything that's gone on, you know, I credit Gonzaga because they had issues in the beginning, with, you know, and, and had to change a bunch of things on their schedule and do a bunch of stuff. Yet they're the number one team in the nation right now, and they're twenty and zero despite everything that they've gone through and, and the fact that they've even gotten to play, you know, twenty games up to this point. Uh, interesting, Rosie, this year of of coronavirus, uh, this past you know, year and what, I mean, almost a year of what we've been dealing with here. And we look at this stuff and, and say to ourselves, okay, Gonzaga is on top, you know, Baylor, who's been coming up the last couple of years, they're up there, uh, Michigan and Ohio state. Okay. Ohio state, Michigan. We've, we've seen that in the past. Houston's rising. We've seen them do some good things. Villanova, you know, Jay Wright is a, is a treasure, but Alabama is rising. Creighton is rising. Florida state has remained relevant. But no Duke, no North Carolina, no Kentucky in the rankings. Kansas is barely in it. What do you think about how the season's gone so far as far as some of the teams are relevant, like Gonzaga, that have stayed relevant? But the Dukes and the Kentuckys and the North Carolinas are not in the rankings. Don't have, you know, there's teams that are struggling not having winning records. So what do you think about, you know, living life in the upside down? And how much of it do you attribute to Corona? And do you attribute any of it to Corona or are just some of these other teams getting better? I mean, because Gonzaga's had to start and stop, so Duke really can't make that excuse. I mean, how do you how do you sift through it all? Well, this, I, uh, I'm i not sure if I talked to you, but uh, what was it, a couple of years ago when, when Syracuse wasn't even supposed to go to the tournament and they ended up going to the Final Four? Yeah. Well, see, there's there's one thing about that, that Syracuse team. I remember I was talking about them and, you know, Syracuse was having a tough time scoring. They'd go in at halftime. They'd have like 30, 28 points, 30 points. But their defense was good. And and uh, I remember saying that uh, coming back at the second half, we're coming into the second half. One team has 28, one has 32. And the other team was used to scoring 80 points. Syracuse was Syracuse had 150 points if they could. And I remember saying there's only one team on the court right now that's comfortable uh, like five minutes into the second half, but no scored, Duke, no you know, North Carolina, no Kentucky in the and rankings. Kansas is barely in it. What do you think about how the season's gone so far? Back, so like just just going 80 points. So, so, is, and in that particular year, we had. Uh, I remember saying, had, "There's only one we, team on the court right uh, now that's comfortable." Uh, starter over the summer. Uh, five minutes into the second half, we scored. We lost starter over the summer. We lost, and that replacement to that starter. Teams are going to start out Frank Howard, 80 points. Then you had dropping in Burrell. So, Sidibe was hurt. And then that particular and year, we had, uh, we still got we to the had, Final Four. And I remember we, saying that. lost, uh, I remember saying that as a starter over the summer. I said, out of uh, all the I teams was, that, uh, that you, uh, that you, we lost, you know, starter over the summer, teams, we lost. How many teams, the replacement to that starter, lost, put this in, out, three Frank players Howard, that were playing major you had, we just kept, and still got to the Final Four. And these were how many teams other than Syracuse University were coached back. still got to the Final Four. And I remember saying then, I thought about it like that. I remember saying then, I said, imagine if, if a I said, out of all the teams, that you, and over the summer you, lost there, you know, the big man uh, teams, there's how many starting teams center, and could have lost and the starting three players over the playing major men have their starting back and still got to the final four in this problem. country. How many teams and still against their final four? Of course, behind. I mean, I'm like, and everybody was like, I was like, how many thought about it? Like, what? I said, imagine if if a Duke had went out there, there and, and over the summer lost their chairs, their starting center, and then 
had the starting point guard we were going able to up. get through and it. Have their Coach starting back of center leadership. have a knee problem. With and pretty still much get anything to the final that could four. go wrong went wrong. I'm like, those guys, and, and I was like, how many, they what? just adjusted. They what? said, they listen, you either cry about it or adjust and try to fill in and try to help out and make things happen. And they did that. So we're seeing now, I kind of figured back then, I, I said, what would have, what, what if Duke would have lost their top three players in a span of uh, eight months? Would they have been able to stay relevant? I think we're getting our answer. You know, and I and I think here, you know, as we as we see this, I mean, how would you describe this year's team looking at things, you know, in, in the sense of, I mean, Marek has had to play out of position. I mean, obviously, you know what it's like to play inside. You're probably three Mareks put into one. But Marek, was, he's also a guy who I liked him in the beginning. I liked him when he came into Syracuse. I'm one of the people that can actually say that, that, you know, I was like, wow, he's got the best vision on the team. Wow, he's the best passer on the team. Wow, he'll do anything. Oh, that didn't show up in the stat sheet, but he ran after that ball. Oh, he tipped that. Oh, he went after this. Oh, he really doesn't care about contact. He likes pushing and putting himself in there. He'll go up against somebody whose arm is bigger than his entire body, and he'll still fight you for it. There were all these things that I saw with Dolajai that I'm like, he would have been relevant 20 years ago, 10 years ago, because he has fight, he has desire, he has determination. He is the raging bull that doesn't really care how small he is, he's coming at you. I respected him for that when he came to Syracuse. I can't believe he's a senior already, but what are your thoughts about Dolajai and the fact that he's had to play out of position and he has had to have the vision. He's had to have, you know, be a good passer. And I think he, in, in, in a lot of different ways, has been at times every different position for Syracuse because he is the most consistent thing they have next to Quincy Garrier, in my opinion. Well, you know, I, when I first saw America when he came here, you know, I, I'm from the European League, so when I saw him, I saw the benefit of having uh, – I've always saw him as a three because in his professional career, if he goes back to Europe, you'll play you'll play professionally as a three because he he'll get the long rebound, he'll get the, he'll take the charge. He's a smart player. He's quick. Everybody talks about how he's undersized. Uh, I, I got two words for him: Lewis Orr. Uh, Lewis Orr used to sub in for me when I was playing. So Lewis played this. He played the four, played the five. You know, he he played. There's there's no saying. Uh, fit in where you get in, and uh, he's definitely done that. And he uh, he will do whatever it takes. I've I've always liked Merrick. I was I liked his, I like his attitude because whatever you ask him to do, he'll go out and do it. Um, people say he's undersized, and I always I always laugh at that because the you can be you can be undersized, but if you're smart, there, you can't you. No matter what size you are, if you get position and you hold your position, even though the player is 250 pounds, if he throws you out of the way, uh, you can't do that small. So you just have to learn how to use your head more, be smarter. Um, and uh, and he's done all of that. I mean, I, I've liked Merrick. I've, I've talked to him. I haven't talked to him in some time, but we talked to him uh, last year, Dale, and I talked to him. Great, great kid. He's uh, very respectful. I really like him. So if you wait for me to say something bad about Merrick, he got the wrong person. <laughs> and I love that. And I love that because he he is somebody that I really feel like people just, like, they're just now starting to appreciate him, which is insane to me because, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, it's like, have you not watched basketball? But, you know, looking at the team this year, looking at Kadari coming in, uh, Jim has him come off the bench, uh, and he's done a lot of great things. He has been the part of... Uh, numerous runs in games where he scored a bunch of points and assisted those points and whatnot. Uh, he's he's been a big part of it. He attacks. He doesn't play like a true freshman. He plays without a lot of fear, uh, if any fear. And so you know when you look at Kadara, you look at Quincy, you know uh, you look at Dolajai and so on and so forth, uh, and Buddy and and Joe. How would you describe this year's makeup, so to speak? You know what? These kids are. They're hard nosed. They're, I mean, they're they're much more mature than their years. Uh, Kadari is. Uh, I'm just amazed. Anytime he gets on a court, he reminds me so much of uh, of Ed Moss that played with uh, that played with us. From the time Ed walked on the court as a freshman, he was in control. Yeah. He never looked like he was having a problem anywhere. He's a really good defender. Um, 
So when you when you when you can base your game on on, on your defensive skill, uh, that's going to put create a problem for the guys that you're playing against and allow you to score without actually being a shooter. You create you can create a, a problem for a guy just by being within his space. He can no longer be comfortable because I, I watch I watch Kadari play people in the front of that zone, and I watch them try to throw the same passes they normally throw when. Let's say Joe's in that position, or if um, uh, or if Buddy's in that position, and they try to throw the same pass. They they throw that pass when Kadari's in there. His reach is like five inches longer than them, and he just it, he just catches it. I'm just and the ones he doesn't catch, he just misses. Which reminds me a lot of Dale Shackelford when he used to play the back of the zone. Dale used to he had he had some of the quickest and the best hands, and if he didn't get the pass, he would tip it, and uh, it just creates. You can't be comfortable around a player like that. You know, you got you want to get in your comfort zone so you can get your shot off, get feel comfortable. If every pass you're throwing, this kid is almost touching, and you, you start all of a sudden you're no longer confident in your ability. So he's creating that. He gives Syracuse that extra. And if they slip up, and they might be trying to avoid him and throw it right to Joe Girard or throw it to Buddy or or get it intercepted by Alan Griffin. I mean, there's there's just so many things that happen because. When he's out there, and I like the fact that he'll take if you give him forty seconds, he'll take it. If you give him forty minutes, he'll take it. He's at that point where he's out there to learn. He's out there to get better, and he will. And the team, the team in and of itself, I have to say, you know that they they they, they weren't allowed that that ten game cushion schedule that they had, where they play teams in New York, in New York, where the the bench gets a chance. Those games are great for the bench to get the chance to develop, for the team to get a chance to understand the chemistry that each one of them has with one another, to get used to playing with one another. Um, so they haven't had that. So we're, 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 their their um, their development is kind of stymied, but they're they're slowly but surely getting through it. There's the stoppages and starts uh, for this Cyrus the virus because that's what I call it because uh, I don't want to. I'm tired of hearing the other words. But right now, they've got their head down, they're focused, they're taking one step at a time, one game at a time, and that's the best way to get through this situation. And good things good things can happen. you got to buy into the program, do what the coach says, and you're going to have those hiccups. But the thing about when the, when the game, when you have a tough game, the greatest thing about a tough game is after the clock goes off, there's nothing you can do about it, which is the same thing about a good win. So you can't relish on what happened, what you just did. You got to have short-term memory and come back out to the next game. It's kind of like my golf game. My golf game, I, it's uh, it's questionable. But if I play with a bunch of good golfers and I, in the first times that I go out and play uh, during the spring, I'm hitting the ball great because I forget what a bad player I am. <laughs> so I've been improving by not by not relishing on the fact that there's certain things I don't do well. So I just been oh, just doing it like what's that so saying? Fake it until you make it. That coming here from Roosevelt Bowie Jr., Syracuse Orange men's basketball alum and fishing entrepreneur. So many great things that we've gotten to talk about here on today's show inside of the Cafe Kubal Studios. Obviously, you're here on Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora. Uh, Rosie, before I let you go, two quick things. Uh, one of them, Dale is listening and watching. What do you want to say to Shaq? Uh, Shaq, there is, I looked out the window, there's about 18 to 22 inches of snow here. I wish I was looking out your window and seeing a little sunshine, but you know what? I'm going to hold on for another, you know, for another few weeks, and then I'm coming down there. So you you can't move and get away from me. There you go. I like I like that. You can't move and get away from me. Final piece, rapid fire. We've done it before, but Rosie, I am not going to put you on the hot seat. You could put me on the hot seat. You're cold enough out there in your Kendall area. So I will let you uh, put me on the hot seat itself. Four questions, anything in the world, sports or non-sports related. Whenever you're ready to go, you got four, and I will gladly sit here and answer them for you, my friend. So uh, you would be, uh, you'd be—you'd like to step up to the plate and learn how to fish then? Uh, yeah, I do, because I, I, I it's been so long, I miss it. And so, uh, you know, I've been wanting to do it for a while. I am a person who has learned a lot of patience over time, and I love nature. I love being out there, and I always loved the uh, the thrill of like getting that bite and then 
knowing that it's it's not as easy as getting the bite you have to still know how to reel it in and stay with it so it's like when you get the bite that's when the game starts and right. so it's it's that's kind of cool to me that there's a challenge within the challenge and yeah so i mean i don't i don't know if that's your first question but yes i do yeah. want to get into it no that, that's good so because we can definitely make that happen also okay. um I'll, uh, I'll let you see. I, I've got a couple of boats that I'm working on. They were actually donated to me. There's, uh, I've got a 14 footer and, a, and, a, and an 18 footer that was donated to me uh, so that I would have. So I'm actually working on three boats now to have them ready to start doing lessons. And it was it was so funny because I didn't know anything about rebuilding. Well, the only thing I knew was that they have a, it has an aluminum aluminum hull. Yeah. And an aluminum never goes bad. So would you be? Could I? Could I get you out there and have you like? ripping a boat apart or drilling holes or doing something hey get, get me out there my dad would want to take pictures because i never did that <laughs> so like but uh, it would be it would be cool to come out and and get to like help you build something and work on something together so i mean it, and it would give me something on the resume that i know how to repair a boat or or, or learn how to reinvigorate one so that could be interesting definitely the funny thing about it was i i got into the market because a good friend of mine that worked at Time, Time, at Time Warner, he wanted to get a new boat. He had an older boat, and his, and his wife said, you don't need a new boat, you got this boat. Yeah. He, he gave me a call on Easter, and he said, open your garage door. I opened my garage door, and he backed this uh, 17-foot uh, aluminum boat in, into my garage. He unhooked it, and as he was getting back into the car, I heard him say, honey, we need a boat. <laughs> so That's good. at that point, I just looked at it. I went online, I Googled it. And I just totally, um, I took everything out of it. It looked like a big bathtub. Then I got a center console. I did the carpeting. I did I did everything. And I did it because I, I looked it up on Google. So, And then after doing that, when I finished, I don't think I had $700, $800 into it. Yeah. it. Not even. It was probably something like four or $500. And, uh, and I had a fantastic fishing boat. So... Uh, that's what I became interested in. I said, you know, the majority of the markets for fishing for, for fishing have you thinking you need a eighty thousand dollar truck and a ninety thousand dollar boat to actually go out and enjoy fishing? Uh, that's not true. So I, I, I want to get be able to make because that's only that's only ten percent of the fishermen in the country fish like that. The other ninety percent fish like me. They go out there, they find they find something. It makes no sense on wasting something that's still good. Because last time I checked. They put this uh, wood and carpeting inside these boats. And after like 10 or 15 years, guess what? It all rots away, which is fantastic because you can go in there, pop the rivets, take them all out, clean them all up, polish them up. I've got a good friend that's going to put a boat wrap on them. And uh, Susan Oshman, who owns Susie's uh, Boutique, she's going to give me a custom cover. So all of a sudden you got you got a little a little old boat that was over in the weeds that turned into something really pretty and uh and you're out there fishing on the water so yeah I'm looking forward to getting you out there yeah no it'd be awesome so that's your first couple what are the other two you got for me uh let me see uh your puppy yeah what's your puppy's name it, it her name is lily and she is a havanese so she's a cuban dog and now you know that Dale has Dale. Uh, Dale went out and got a little puppy there. I don't know the don't know the puppy's name. I'm not allowed to because my nephew puppy doesn't want me to talk to other puppies. So, but Dale has a beautiful dog uh, that he uh, that he just picked up. Yeah, you know Charlie and uh, Charlie's awesome and uh, really cool to uh, to see the pictures and, and to talk with Dale about that. So yeah, my uh, my puppy Lily, she's. Uh, She's like having a daughter, I tell you that much. And I mean, to me, she is. So she's a good girl. She's awesome, and I love her. And uh, she's really, uh, she's a game changer. What's your What's your last one for me, sir? Uh, my last question is more of a comment. I just want to thank you for um, you're the one that introduced me into this online, you know, interviewing online. Uh, Orange Appeal and Dale and I worked together for a few years. And it's just something that I wanted to thank you for taking the time out to explain to me how it was all done. No, I, I appreciate I appreciate that, and I know Dale has, has said stuff before, and and I don't even know. I mean, you guys, you guys are a part of the the fabric of my city, and I respect that so very much. I'm I'm honored and privileged to know you both, and to speak with you both, and to call you both friends, and 
to be able to be around you and just have that time. And, and so for you to give me any type of any, I don't even know, any type of credit on, on anything. I mean, I, I don't know what to say. I appreciate it. I'm honored by it. I never thought that, you know, these, these two giants of, uh, of Syracuse basketball, in my opinion, would, would have that, I, that there's anything I could have done to help you guys, but uh, it, it means the world to me that, you know, you give me any type of credit with that. I, I appreciate that. I, I don't know what to say, Rosie, but I respect you and I thank you. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy to help where I can. And, and those words really do mean a lot to me. Well, I thank you. It's my pleasure. And I know that uh, I know that Dale's sitting out in that sunshine. Get out there and soak up some for me. <laughs> he actually said, he said, tell Rosie he's welcome anytime. And that he's possibly going to get you on his salt and pepper show if you want to be on that. So absolutely, absolutely. I want to get him on just to, just to talk about because you know my our friends up here are still wondering what he's doing. I want to make sure they know because uh, Dale, Dale Dale's a little spicy, so I I enjoy uh, I enjoy listening to his show also. Yeah, that that coming to you uh, right here from Roosevelt Bowie Jr. inside of the Cafe Coupal Studios on Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora. Rosie, as always, thank you, thank you for your kind words. I look forward to fishing with you soon and learning about all of that. And, uh, and I, I hope you stay warm and stay safe and just know that I appreciate you and, and I very much uh, value the time that you give me. So thank you for that. It's my pleasure. I'm looking forward to it myself. You have a great day. All right. Take care. All righty. That coming from Roosevelt Bowie Jr. here on Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora. Did I just say I'm going to fix a boat? Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. My dad's like, burr? <laughs> so, but uh, we'll take a step aside for a fast break on Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora. When we come back, we will uh, definitely have some fun here uh, where sports meets life with the ingredients to success. So stay right here on Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora. Thank you for being here, and thank you for always uh, having fun with us here where sports meets life. In these unique times, there are those in our community that give us a sense of normalcy and positivity. Pizza Man on 50 Oswego Street in Baldwinsville has been here for you for over 35 years and is here now. Call 315-638-1234 or order online at pizzamanbville.com to bring those familiar tastes into your home. And remember to come see our monthly on-site broadcasts centered around the community and our Baldwinsville Bees. Pizza Man in Baldwinsville. Any way you slice it, they are always here for you. I'm George Townsend of Honda City with some good advice from buying a new car. The true cost of owning a new car is determined by the appraised value when you trade it. No vehicle appraises higher than a Honda. Next, look for low APRs and deep discounts. You also want low maintenance costs and great fuel economy. That's why my advice to you is to buy a new Honda. Looking pre-owned, visit our Honda Certified Used Car Center. Honda City, 7140 Henry Clay Boulevard, Liverpool, or hondacity-cny.com. It would be a pity if you don't shop. This is Jimmer Sikowski, owner-operator of Chick-fil-A Cicero, 7916 Brewerton Road in Cicero, right in front of the Home Depot. I had a deep feeling that God wanted me to do something bigger with my life and to help people, help others. I kept putting Chick-fil-A in my life, and I realized as I was going through the franchise selection process that uh, positively impacted the lives of others was really core to what we do here at Chick-fil-A. First of all, it starts with the food. The food is brought in fresh daily you know, we bring in local produce we prepare to order in the kitchen we hand butter our chicken we hand spin our milkshakes it's it's great food it doesn't taste like fast food i, I think the second thing is is the way people feel when they come in a chick-fil-a restaurant it's different we, we try to treat people with intentional kindness here which is very different and deeper than good customer service and so I think it feels remarkable for most people to come in a Chick-fil-A restaurant. And then lastly, the impact that we try to have in the community is very different. It's a big part of the expectation of every operator of a Chick-fil-A restaurant is that they're actively engaged in their community, they're a leader in the community, and they're, they're making a difference. When they realize that what we're striving to do 
is to shine a little light in their life, that's a very, very different experience uh, than you will have at any other quick service restaurant. And it's that remarkable experience that I think people will emotionally connect with. Cafe Cabal Mobile Cafe brings the cafe experience to you. We'll roll out to your neighborhood or office, ready to serve our locally crafted espresso bar to our loyal patrons. Inquire at cafecabal.com. Cafe Cabal, coffee for the soul. Mon Paz Kettle Corn and Popcorn Factory, located on 201 7th North Street in Liverpool, is home to over 40 flavors with more than 200 flavors in their total wheelhouse. Sky's the limit for this sweet and savory Central New York company. Keep it local at your parties, fundraisers, wedding showers, baby showers, and more by calling 315-450-MA-PA. That's 315-450-6272 for popcorn bars with custom flavors and colors at your upcoming event. Make sure to visit them on 201 7th North Street in Liverpool, New York. And for more information, go to maandpazsnacks.com. Ma and Paz Kettle Corn and Popcorn Factory. How corny are you? The Millhouse Market, located on 3790 New York 13 in Pulaski, New York, is worth the drive every time. Make sure you take the time to head out there every Tuesday through Sunday where they are open with their drive-up window. You can go there and get your favorites. Download the app and you'll have everything at your fingertips on the Apple app or Google Play Store. You can search Millhouse Market and you'll have their homemade breads, desserts, brick oven pizzas, quinoa bowls, rice bowls, salads, and... All of their sandwiches that are named after the families that helped to settle today's Pulaski. Ingrained in our community and ingrained in our taste buds, the Mill House Market is second to none when it comes to their attention to detail, the combination of flavors that they bring to you, and that guest service. They're also open with their bistro inside restaurants uh, at the on the weekends, and they do have their general store that's open throughout the week with local products from local companies. So, so many different ways to interact with the Millhouse Market and so many different ways to bring home something that your family's going to get very excited about, from surf and turf to the bee sting pizza to sun-dried tomato mozzarella bread so many great things at the millhouse market and it is definitely absolutely positively no matter what the season worth the drive every time to 3790 new york 13 in pulaski new york for the mill house market with that being stated back here on wake up call with dan tortora where sports meets that thing being here inside of the cafe kubal studios cafe kubal coming to you with five different locations and those locations that are here for you are uh, truly, uh, truly all amazing places. All have their own style, which I think is really cool because they're all Cafe Kubal, but they're all they all look like unique local places, and it's really awesome to see it that way. That each of them are connected because they're all the same company, but they each have their own. It's kind of like a bunch of kids in the same family. They're all part of the same family, but they all have their own style. So make sure that you go and see Cafe Kubal and. You know, take some time to bounce around each one. 3501 James Street, 401 South Salina Street, 324 West Water Street, and 208 North Townsend Street, all in Syracuse. And then you can find them also in Manlius for their location on 343 Fayette Street in Manlius, New York, their newest location. So make sure that you do that today. We're at our final portion of today's broadcast inside of MonPazPopcorn.com's What's Poppin'. You heard from Wolfgang Schaefer, you've heard from Roosevelt Bowie, and now it's time to hear those ingredients to success. Proudly brought to you by Avicoli's on the corner of Route 57 and Wetzel Road in Liverpool, New York. It is my absolute, absolute honor and privilege to be able to bring this to you every single Tuesday broadcast of the show and to round out the broadcast to be able to do this with you. So we pick a topic in the moment, and then I give you the ingredients to success for that topic. So, you know, 
the topic for me uh, for this one that I'd have to say is be open minded. You know, I would say be open minded. And that's something to, you know, that's that's going to be the topic for for today for the ingredients to success is to essentially be open minded. Because you never know what life is going to bring you. Listen, Corona happened. Who thought that was going to happen? (laughs) Obviously, not even the scientists. So maybe some did, maybe some didn't. But the reality of it all is things have happened in our world that we didn't know were going to happen. Right? And we sit here this morning trying to figure all that out, trying to sift through it all. Corona happens unexpectedly. You meet people unexpectedly. You, you know, I mean, I can honestly tell you that when I graduated college, I wanted to go somewhere, but I didn't know where I wanted to go. And I didn't necessarily want to go back home, but I went home for like three months. And then I came back to right down the road where I graduated college And I worked there and then I ended up back in Syracuse and then I went down to Orlando and then I thought like I might live in Florida forever. And then I came back to central New York, you know, and now I look at my life and say, you know, in the next 10 years, where am I going to be? What am I going to be doing? So I think, I think that there's something cool to be said about the reality to, you know, it's it's a big brother topic, honestly. It's a big brother moniker, which is expect the unexpected, for those of you that watch the show. And you never know what's going to happen. You don't. You know, and, and, and that is because we, we meet people, we make connections, that turns into business stuff, it turns into personal stuff. It's game changing, it's life changing. And I think the, the best things in life are that, you know, when you meet good people, and you're around good people, you got to follow your gut. You know, my gut has never led me wrong. It's never steered me astray, honestly, because I believe your gut is like God speaking to you, like really deep down inside of you, kind of yelling up to you. And I've been in situations where I feel like God whispered in my ear, like, I need you to do this. And when I didn't listen, he would come back and say, why didn't you do this? So, you know, I do believe that God speaks to us I do believe that, you know, having a strong faith will help you to find the answers that you need. And I believe that even if you don't have the strongest faith, God is still going to knock on your door and you're going to hear something somehow. You know, I I do believe somebody's looking out for us. I do believe that, you know, somebody wants us to have the best life possible. And I do believe in divine intervention because, listen, it's hard to make decisions in life. It's hard to figure some things out really is. And, you know, if I've learned anything in my life, it's that if possible, what you believe in divine intervention, because listen, you know, you say, I'm going to meet the person I'm going to marry here, right? You know, I'm going to meet them in Florida, or I'm going to meet them in, you know, my backyard, or I'm going to do this job and I'm going to live in this city for the rest of my life. Or, you know, I'm going to, you know, I'm, I mean, when I grew up, I always wanted to have siblings, you know what I mean? So you never know how things are going to happen. You never know how things are going to shake out. You, you really don't. And I used to get so mad growing up when somebody would say, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. But what I realized is his plans are always better than mine are. And I don't fight him on it anymore. You know, I, I will talk very openly. I and you know, I, I prayed very deeply last night, and I pray every day. And and I I had a conversation with God saying like, hey, I don't know why this or why that, but you do know it, and so you're going to carry it. You're gonna you're gonna help me figure it out. You know, so I, I think I think the ingredients topic for this week is to be open minded because our world changed in the past year because uh, what we think is best for us may not always be best for us. What we say we don't want to do may not be the right course to go. You know, there's times where I didn't want to do something that I needed to do and then I wanted to do something that I shouldn't have. 
And so you learn a lot and you really grow. And when 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 opportunities arise, you know, you got to be willing to take them. I am the type of person that I've seen enough in 35 years of being alive that, you know, I meet I meet a fantastic woman, a great woman. I don't care where she's from. I'll make it work. I love the thought of being a part of movies and stand up comedy and different things that wherever God wants me, I'm willing to do it. You know, I'll go up to Vancouver. I'll go to Toronto. I'll go to, you know, Atlanta. I'll do what I got to do. I'll go out to Hollywood and I'll, you know, give a shot at this, that and whatever. And, you know, I talked a lot about wanting to go to Italy and see my family, wanting to go to the Sudan and, and really like dig into that and see if we have family there and then go to Spain. And, then Corona hits and I'm like, Dan, the only thing holding you back was you. And now you can't go over there. So what are you going to do? So I, I think, I think what you realize, what I've at least realized during Corona is, you know, you don't appreciate how easy things are, right? Like I used to just drive up to Canada just because go stay in Toronto for a weekend, go to a Raptors game, walk around the city. I would, I'm notorious for going to Toronto, putting my bag down wherever I'm staying, and then walking outside and figuring it out. No GPS, no nothing, cars parked, and I'm just walking. And normally it's like 12 degrees outside or negative 12, but I just walk. And I found Wahlburgers there, which I love Wahlburgers. And I found Wayne Gretzky's restaurant. I found the Toronto sign, you know, by the water that lights up different colors. I found this kind of like clock tower church that looks like the one where uh, Spider-Man was in in one of the movies. You know, I, I've gotten to really learn a lot. I, I found an indoor mall that's kind of like in the middle of Toronto and it's it's set. It's like it's in, it, there's like street here, street here, and it's right here. And you walk down into it and you can't even see it, but you're like in this small that you don't even know that you're in. So I found this really great place that has a lounge that I never sat in the lounge. And I, when I go back, I actually want to like eat there, or relax there because it looks like a VIP place. And it's, you know, just a bar restaurant, but I shouldn't say just a bar restaurant. It's a really awesome place, but I would like to, you know, actually sit in the lounge and enjoy that. So, you know, I would tell you, expect the unexpected. I would tell you, you know, if you say I'm never going to do this or I'm never going to go there, or I'm never going to think about this, you know, I don't say that to God anymore. What I say to God is, if there's something good that comes my way, let me know. If there's something bad that comes my way, let me know. So that I know the difference and that I, you know, react accordingly. Because life is way too precious to waste time and... You know, I genuinely take risks in life, but I calculate them and I go after the things that I want. And that's what I'm known for. Like, I will go after whatever, whenever, however, whomever, if I believe in it. And that fight has always been inside of me and I'm grateful for that. So I think, you know, my ingredients to success for you today are to really just sit back and think about, you know, if you're not chasing something, why? If you're not going after something, why? And if you are going after something, why? And if you are chasing something, why? Because sometimes we get in the, the run of things and, and we forget why we got in it in the first place. You know, why do we choose to do this in the first place? And, you know, I was reminded this whole past year why I got into owning my own business and being a broadcaster and all that stuff. And, I was also reminded of all the other things I want to do that I haven't done yet. So I think that life has a voice. I say that voice is God's. You could say that voice is whatever you want to say it is, but I say that that voice is God's. That, and that voice does speak. And when that voice speaks, you know, I think, you know, it would be behoove you to listen to it. Because you never know what it's going to say. And you never know how awesome it's going to be if you listen to it. So, I would pray on whatever's ailing you right now, whatever's on your mind, whatever's on your heart. I would listen in the silence. 
I would trust your gut. And it's never too late to go after what you want in life. And you're never too old. You know? And I think that the beauty of life is when something really true and honest comes your way, you know, you just, I don't know, for me, you kind of just pick it up and give it a hug and say thank you to God for it, you know. So appreciate your blessings, appreciate the things that come your way, and give life everything you got because, you know, my friends live all over this world. And there's nothing I wouldn't do for them. You know? Yeah, I miss Dale. Yeah, I miss Ev. Yeah, I miss Ross. Yeah, you know, I miss Vale. I miss Donald. Happy birthday. Shout out to Donald. It's just his birthday. You know? I I miss Nico and Miguel and, and Jason and and Rosie. I know I said Dale. And, you know, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of people that, that, I just, that I just miss. My Aunt Donna, my Aunt Ev. You know, uh, Papa Joe, Mary, Joey, Brandon, John, Steve, you know, there, there's, but the thing about life is when you know what you got and it's good and you hold on to it, you're enriched. Shout out to Matt, who's been there for me in a massive way. Thank you for that, brother. Shout out to Joe. Shout out to another Joe. <laughs> there's a lot of there's a lot of really good people, and if I somehow didn't say your name, don't think that you're not a part of that. Um, life is precious, and if I've learned anything, when God wakes me up, I don't even know if I have these 24 hours to live. And there's a song called "If You Had 24 Hours to Live, Where Would You Go? What Would You Do?" And I can only tell you how I would answer that question on a daily basis, and I know how I would answer it today. So that's a beautiful thing. And I pray that you go after what you want, that you don't live with regret, and that you're willing to take a chance. Because if I didn't take the calculated risks that I took, if I didn't leap hoping to God I could fly, I wouldn't be sitting here this morning, I wouldn't own my own business, I wouldn't have my house, I wouldn't have Lily, and I wouldn't be who I am. So, not every road works out, but some of these roads are so beautiful, and I would rather take a road and realize that it's a dead end than always look back at that road going, I wonder what would have happened if I took it. So live your life to the fullest. Live with as little regret as possible. And keep smiling. And keep shining. And always, always put your best foot forward and be yourself. Because you're a beautiful person. And I put that out this weekend. And, you know, I got a message back from somebody saying, you know, I really don't feel like that. You know, I, I appreciate the message, but I don't, I don't feel beautiful. I feel run down. I just feel, I just feel down. And I wrote back to this total stranger and I said, you know, whatever you're going through right now, you're going to get through it. And I know that it feels like right now you can't, but you will. Because if I had a nickel for every time I thought, oh my God, this is the worst thing ever. I'm not going to get through this. I would have so many nickels. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's funny how like you think you can't do something and then 13 years later, you're looking back on it going... Not only did I do that, I did 20 other things and, you know, look at me now. So worrying never solves a problem. I could tell you that. And, uh, you know, one of my best friends said one of the most incredible things to me today, and I love you for it. He said to me, this is the message I got this morning. Nerves just mean that you want something a lot. Because sometimes when we're anxious and we're stressed and we're nervous, we're like, oh my God, it's a bad thing. And he sent it to me today and he said, you know what, Dan? Nerves, 
Nerves are just the reality of letting you know that you really want something in your life. A lot. So, glass half full, people. Be good, be positive, and be you. From the Cafe Kubal Studios, this is Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora. Thank you so much for being here. I want to shout out my esteemed guests, Mr. Wolfgang Schaefer and Roosevelt Bowie Jr. A big shout out to Avicoli's for the Ingredients to Success, who find us Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. Eastern Time on Facebook.com backslash Live Now DT, on MixLR.com backslash Wake Up Call DT, as well as on YouTube.com backslash Wake Up Call DT, and on Wake Up Call DT.com's home page. You can search for these shows on Stitcher, Spotify, MixLR, TuneIn, Podbean, iHeartRadio, iTunes, and Apple Podcasts, and of course, like I said, on YouTube.com backslash Wake Up Call DT is where we're live, and it's also where the archive is featured in the same place, just like MixLR dot com backslash wake up call dt and a proud thank you and please 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 somehow some way this week go out and do something with any one of these places you know a, a slice of pizza a bag of kettle corn uh, you know looking and touring for your next car an ice cream cone some wildcat wings you know uh, some some pizza man pizza some treats, uh, maple brownies and M&M cookies from the milk house market, dropping your dog off at the daycare or the dog boarding or going in there and, and picking up food for your dog or a new leash for your dog or one of the, you know, peeing on the virus really funny uh, shirts that they had for COVID-19 or going to Chick-fil-A Cicero and grabbing yourself that, that Oreo milkshake, whatever it may be, or going to Cafe Kubal and getting chai because that is what I love there or the chocolate bread or the chocolate banana bread or the upstate sandwich or anything they have. Listen, or shooting over to Avicoli's and getting some veal parmesan. Anything you can do this week to help them out. Now more than ever, our companies in our community need us. They employ our kids. They employ us. They employ our parents, our grandparents. They're so much more than just a place. And these beautiful places that work with me mean the world. So please go out there and support them. Carvel DeWitt, Cafe Kubal, Wildcat Sports Pub, Honda City of Liverpool, Chick-fil-A Cicero, Avicoli's, Canine Camp Dog Daycare, Pizza Man, Canine Campground Dog Boarding, The Millhouse Market, and Ma and Pa's Kettle Corn. Go to maandpazpopcorn.com. Anywhere in the 50 states, use the promo code DT20. It's DT20. You get 20% off on me. So make sure that you do that. Thank you to all of our central and upstate New York partners. We love you. And now more than ever, we are here for you as we've always been. So a big thanks and a big shout out to every single one of you. And with that being stated, find us on Facebook at Wake Up Call DT, Twitter at Call DT, and Instagram at Wake Up Call underscore DT. I hope you have a fantastic day. I hope you stay safe. I hope you take calculated risks. I hope that you know that you uh, live in a world where you have to expect the unexpected and you put your best foot forward and you take a chance. You take a chance because... Nothing good in life has ever been done by people not taking a chance. So with that being said, I'll talk with you soon. God bless. No stress. Do your best.